Chapter 1030 What is their relationship? There was complete silence in the club. Everyone turned to look at Cheryl incredulously. Then, they looked back at their boss who was always scolding them. Chester was 30 years old this year. His wife had just given birth to their son recently, so he didn't have as much time as before to visit the club these days. Cheryl had already met the adorable and pretty baby boy before. Chester, who had been so busy taking care of his son and related matters, could finally relax now. He said, hey, leader, let's play around together. However, the heartless Cheryl replied, I don't feel like playing with you. Why, you're horrible at it, quote comma quote. When Cheryl's teammates heard her blunt reply, none of them dared to even utter a word. Zack looked at the two of them thoughtfully. As for Lionel, he widened his eyes and glanced at Cheryl worriedly. Although he had been astonished by Chester calling God C, leader, just now, Chester was ultimately still their boss. God C was simply too rude. What if their boss got mad and refused to pay her salary? True enough, Chester did get mad. If you don't play with me, I won't pay you your salary. He would remit Cheryl's salary to his sister-in-law instead. Cheryl glanced at him. Do what you want. Didn't he know that money was the last thing she lacked at the moment? Chester. Chester was obviously at a disadvantage in the conversation, yet nobody could tell for some reason, and they even thought that Cheryl had thoroughly enraged Chester. A smiling Lionel immediately said, We'll play with you, instead, boss. He took a step forward and stood between Cheryl and Chester, shielding her behind him. After spending more than 20 days together, Lionel had already started to become protective of her. Cheryl was now the club's favorite person. An aggrieved Chester whined, I've been having such a hard time lately because I have to take care of my kid. Can't you agree to my request when I finally have a day off today? Quote comma quote. At the sight of his pitiful expression, the helpless Cheryl could only reply, fine, just one round, okay. Five, one, three. In the end, Cheryl heaved a quiet sigh and relented. Two rounds. You're on. Chester immediately grabbed Lionel's computer and mouse and logged into his account. Come on, hurry up and log in. Chester liked playing as a mage, so every time he came, Lionel would have to sit out and let him play instead. He was more than happy to do so, too. After all, their boss was not only horrible at the game, but also had an awful temper. Whoever played with him would end up having to suffer. Lionel stood at the side and waited. However, after the game started, he found that their boss was actually playing calmly and wasn't losing his temper. In the past, whenever Zack fought in the jungle, he always had to go to the middle lane to help him fight the minions there before quickly leaving because he mustn't steal the experience points. However, when the battle started, Zack promptly went to the bottom lane after just a moment's hesitation. Sure enough, Chester only glanced at him as though he wanted to say something, but held back in the end. After a while, ah, I died again. Leader, why didn't you come and save me? Save you. Chesty, please look at whether you're worth it. Is there any point in saving you? Even an advanced cannon does more damage than you. Lionel. Leader, someone assassinated me again. I'm weak only because I gave you all the coins we earned, so you're not allowed to laugh at me. Ha, huh, I'd rather give all the coins the team earned to a wild boar instead of you. At least the wild boar knows that it should counterattack the enemy, but what about you? You were knocked out in one hit before you could even cast any of the mage's skills, you should learn how to move first. Lionel. Although it felt great to see their boss, who was always scolding them, suffer a setback for once, was it really alright for God C to diss him like that? Also, God C was so scary. She didn't even need to use swear words when she insulted someone. No wonder their boss always said that his prowess at dishing out insults couldn't compare to even half of his leaders. Lionel swallowed. At the end of the round, even though Cheryl and Zack led their teammates to victory, the game didn't bring Chester any joy at all. He looked at Cheryl aggrievedly. Hey, leader. Be a good boy and go back to the baby. This game doesn't suit you. Quote comma quote. In the end, she still played another round with her poor uncle. Although he still got scolded, Chester felt totally refreshed this time. After the game, he got ready to leave. 
When he was leaving, all the members of the club went to see him off. Cheryl also followed them out the door. Chester looked at everyone except for Cheryl and said threateningly, You guys better treat my leader well, you hear? Or all of you will be in for it. Everyone. After speaking, Chester looked at Cheryl cheerfully and then suddenly leaned in close to her. He lowered his voice and said, By the way, Justin wants me to remind you that it's Nora's birthday this month. Got it. Cheryl sighed silently. Her dad celebrated her mom's birthday grandly every year. Her mom clearly didn't like it, but her dad insisted that life was about having a sense of ceremony, so she was also forced to prepare birthday gifts for her mom every year. Sigh, how troublesome. After the exchange, Chester left in the car. He had moved to San Francisco for good. Not only was he near the club, but he could also escape the hunt's control. Life couldn't get any better. After he left, the way Lionel and the others looked at Cheryl changed. Zack was even convinced that Cheryl must be related to the Smiths in New York. Otherwise, a hunt would never put up with her temper. But soon, he didn't have the time or leisure to think about Cheryl's identity because something had happened to their club again. It was also about Cheryl this time. The next morning, social media went into an uproar. Someone had taken photos of Chester leaving the club the previous night, and the person who had posted the photos even maliciously edited the photos before posting them online. Everyone was now secretly saying that Cheryl had only wormed her way into the club by relying on her feminine wiles. They even called Cheryl a homewrecker. After all, most people knew that Chester was married. The head coach was furious. Lionel was puzzled. We all know this isn't true. Besides, it's obvious that the photos are photoshopped. What are you panicking about? The head coach glared at Lionel and then said, Boss was whispering into Cheryl's ear in the photo. The two of them are too close to each other physically, I'm afraid that Mr. Hunt's wife will see the photo. How do you think she'll look at the photo? Lionel. The head coach sighed. If the boss's wife asks me to fire Cheryl, should I fire her or not? Lionel. The head coach looked at him. Also, although we all know the truth, can Cheryl guarantee that it will not affect her? She is also good friends with the boss in the game. I'm afraid that this incident will affect their friendship. This may seem like a terrible move on their end, but they are going for a psychological attack. The qualifiers are about to start, and it's highly likely that we'll be matched with Club JQ right in the qualifiers. What if Cheryl becomes emotionally unstable at this time and doesn't perform well in the competition? While the head coach was worrying over this, a voice reached them from outside. Coach, this is terrible. Boss and his wife are here. The head coach. Lionel panicked. What should we do? The lady boss is here, will she really make things difficult for God C? I'll take God C and go into hiding right away. Even Zack broke into a frown and looked worried this time. To be honest, when their boss and that kid leaned in so close to each other that day, he had found their actions rather inappropriate. After all, men and women should keep a respectable distance from each other, and it wasn't like they were family. Amid their worry, Chester openly walked into the room. Chapter 1031 Chapter 1031 Chester's niece Everyone in the training room looked serious and on guard. Lionel looked at Cheryl worriedly. Cheryl looked at the door. Like Chester, his wife was also the daughter of a rich family, the kind that mucked around and did nothing purposeful in life. She was cheerful and magnanimous. As soon as she entered, her eyes immediately fell on Cheryl and she said, God see, I've come to visit you. Everyone in the club. As expected, the lady boss was here for God see however, Cheryl stood and greeted her politely. Hi, auntie. Everyone. Everyone looked at Cheryl in disbelief, all of them incredulous that she had called the other woman, Auntie. Even if she was reluctant to call her, Mrs. Hunt, she should at least have used something that sounded younger. The lady boss wasn't even 30 yet. Hey, don't call me that. The lady boss suddenly became stern. See, as expected, it made her angry. Lionel immediately took a step forward with a big smile. However, just as he was about to speak, the lady boss said cheerfully, Call me Kitty. Everyone. The corners of Cheryl's lips spasmed. Both her aunt and uncle were equally undependable. The couple had often made her game with them in the past, and her aunt's nickname in the game was none other than, Kitty. 
She coughed. Why are you here? Everyone in the club. Lionel felt like Cheryl looked just like a conversation killer right now. This was their club. Why couldn't they come over? Yet, for some reason, the lady boss was still smiling brightly. She said, I saw the trending topics on social media, so I came over to visit you. Those people sure are gossipy. They are not scared to spout all kinds of nonsense. Your relationship with Chester. Before she could even finish, Lionel hastily interrupted her and said, they are gaming friends. Nothing else. The lady boss. She raised her eyebrows and looked at Chester. Chester winked at her. When the incident broke out after he returned home the day before, his wife had insisted on coming over to clarify matters as she was afraid that the people in the club would misunderstand Cheryl. He had told her that it wasn't necessary, after all, he could already tell from his visit the day before that his leader was most definitely the favorite in the club, but his wife refused to believe him and simply insisted on coming over. See, her teammates treated her incredibly well. Right at this moment, Cheryl's aunt's cell phone started ringing. Her aunt could only give them an apologetic look and pick up her cell phone. But when she saw the caller's name on the screen, she raised her eyebrows. Who is it? A concerned Chester glanced at her phone. It's Jimmy. His wife explained, she played pretty well as a support class previously. You don't like me playing with guys, so I played two rounds with her. We added each other on Facebook after that. Oh even though Chester wasn't bothered, he nevertheless heaved a sigh of relief. Cheryl's aunt picked up the phone. The voice of Jimmy, who was from Club JQ, rang out at the other end of the phone. Hi, Mrs. Hunt. Are you okay? Cheryl's aunt. Baffled at the other woman's question, she replied, I'm doing pretty well. However, Jimmy continued as though she didn't hear her. You don't have to hold yourself back in front of me. We are friends, after all. No, wait, have you looked at Facebook yet? But right after saying that, Jimmy acted as if she had said something she shouldn't have and said, I'm sorry, Mrs. Hunt. Mr. Hunt must have forbidden you from spending too much time on your cell phone since you just gave birth recently. I shouldn't have said so much. Her actions screamed hypocrisy. Cheryl's aunt said straightforwardly, all right, that's enough. You must be referring to Cheryl, the female member of our club, right? Oh, you're aware. Jimmy began to console her. Cheer up. But I'm not upset. Jimmy said, I know you must be upset, so you really don't have to pretend that you're not. Anyone would be upset if their husband cheated on them when they've just given birth to his child. Of course, I'm not saying that Mr. Hunt must have cheated on you. He would never do anything like that. It must have been Cheryl who seduced him instead. Besides, she probably hasn't succeeded. Yet. What the fuck? What did you just say? Cheryl seduced Chester. Cheryl's aunt's voice suddenly rose. Everyone in the club turned to look at her. Lionel, Zack, and Benjamin tensed up at once, afraid that the other party would successfully sow discord between the lady boss and Cheryl. Chunk walked over to Cheryl and whispered, Come on, God see. Hurry up and explain everything to her. What am I supposed to explain? Asked Cheryl. Chunk. Everyone else. On the phone, Jimmy was still going on. Calm down, I'm sure there's nothing between the two of them. Don't worry. Of course I'm not worried. Cheryl's aunt sneered and said, why would anything ever happen between the two of them? Her words made everyone in the club heave a sigh of relief. It seemed that the lady boss trusted Godsey very much. Phew. However, the next moment, everyone's eyes widened in shock. The lady boss shouted angrily, don't you dare add fuel to the fire. Do you think I'm not aware of your purpose in calling me? Do you think you can do anything you want just because you've joined Club JQ? Who do you think you are? Jimmy pretended to be aggrieved and said, Mrs. Hunt, I know you must be frustrated and depressed, but you shouldn't lose your temper at me. Mr. Hunt comes from a very good family. Although he is not a direct descendant of the Hunts, he shares a good relationship with the current head of the family. I know you'll definitely want to keep this matter under wraps and deal with it together with him. Dot, but you shouldn't let yourself suffer in vain. You can kick up a bit of a fuss and at least get Mr. Hunt to kick that woman out of the club. Cheryl's aunt interrupted her again. What do you mean by, that woman? She's only 15. She's still a child. 
also, who would freaking dare to kick Chester's niece out of the club? Chapter 1032 Chapter 1032 See you at the competition. Her words stunned the other party right away. The club also fell completely silent in an instant. Lionel, who had been worrying about Cheryl, looked at her in surprise when he heard what the lady boss said. Then, he looked at Chester. Cheryl and Peter shared identical facial features. Though they were indistinguishable from each other when they were children, now that they had grown up, it was now possible to tell one apart from the other. After all, Peter was already starting to go through a growth spurt and was now half a head taller than Cheryl. They were only 15 years old now, so he would only grow taller in the future. The older Peter became, the more he resembled Justin. Cheryl's facial features were very similar to Justin's, except that they were gentler and younger. Despite her young age, she was already a stunning beauty, and it was obvious that she would become a second Brenda once she grew up 70% of the twins' appearance took after their father's. Therefore, if one looked closely, they would see that Cheryl and Chester did resemble each other somewhat. Wasn't Cheryl's last name Smith, though? How could she possibly be a hunt? On the phone, Jimmy was also stunned. W what did you say, Mrs. Hunt? But, dot but her last name is Smith. Cheryl's aunt sneered. Can't she take her mother's surname? You fool. In my opinion, you shouldn't stay in the club anymore. That place doesn't suit you. After saying that, she hung up. However, she went on after hanging up and said, what a foolish woman, doesn't she know who she is messing with? To think she had the guts to call me. Chester, call Club JQ immediately and tell them to fire Jimmy. Look at how much trouble they have caused God see all because of that woman. It's not quite appropriate of us to bully others like this, right? Asked Chester. Cheryl's aunt sneered and asked, do you know what I love the most? What? Bullying others. Chester had long since wanted to do this, but he didn't dare to reveal Cheryl's identity to the public. After all, Justin had never once publicly announced anything in order to protect his three children. If he kicked up a fuss, wouldn't he end up exposing Cheryl's identity? But since his wife had said so, then it must be all right for him to do so. Chester picked up his cell phone and called Club JQ immediately. Have you had enough yet? I want you to fire Jimmy immediately. Otherwise, Club JQ will cease to exist. Why? Ha, huh, because she called my wife and made her angry. After saying this, Chester hung up. While Chester was on the phone, Cheryl's aunt was also talking to the rest of the team cheerfully. Do you know why my niece took her mother's last name? By then, Lionel and the others were already numb to further shocks, and their brains were not even functioning anymore. Because she's hiding her identity, of course. My niece wants a quiet, peaceful life without any disturbances. Get it? Lionel and the others nodded. On the side, when Zack saw this, he couldn't help but hold his forehead. The guys in the team were so shocked by Cheryl's identity that they didn't even understand what the lady boss was trying to say. He kept quiet for a while and then said, Don't worry, I won't tell anyone about it. Only then did Lionel and the others react. They nodded hurriedly and echoed, Yeah, we won't tell anyone. Lionel then asked, But what about Jimmy? The lady boss smiled and replied, Don't worry, she's a smart one. She knows that there are things she can say and things she can't. Even though she had offended her in this industry, things weren't that bad for her. At the very least, she could continue live streaming even after she was kicked out of the club. However, if she told outsiders that she had offended the hunts, then she could forget about making a living in other industries, too. Zack understood this very quickly. Rather, it was Lionel and the others who didn't understand how such things worked in the wealthy circle. Regardless, they didn't probe any further. The lady boss was always right anyway. As they had a month-old infant at home, Chester and his wife didn't stay long at the club. They left shortly. Ten minutes later, Lionel, who was scrolling through Facebook, smiled and said, Did you see? Jimmy has made a post saying that she is quitting Club JQ because gaming is ultimately not something for her. Club JQ had also posted on Facebook and announced that they had terminated their contract with Jimmy, citing incompatibility issues as the reason. Surprisingly enough, their fans didn't show much of a reaction.
After all, few girls played professionally in the first place. Some clubs had tried using this as a gimmick before, but it had ultimately failed. Jimmy's departure made Club JQ fans breathe sighs of relief instead. The trending news about Cheryl and Chester had also died down without anyone realizing it. In fact, there wasn't even any news about them anywhere on Facebook. It was as if the incident had never happened. However, in order to prevent similar incidents, they nevertheless secretly released a piece of news to the public, Cheryl and Chester were relatives. As the piece of news died down before it even gained traction, few noticed it. However, Club HS fans were a little worried. They went to Club HS and the members' Facebook pages and left messages. For the sake of the championship, shouldn't we cancel Cheryl? Club JQ has already terminated their contract with Jimmy. Why don't you guys do it, too? Girls really are a bit lacking when it comes to esports. I'm not looking down on girls here, I'm a girl myself, but girls' reflexes really aren't as quick as boys. Are you guys really not going to consider the suggestion? Are you guys planning on giving up the championship this year because you've won for so many years? Members of other clubs on good terms with Club HS also had mentioned Zach in their respective group chats. It was common for people to switch teams during their time as professional esports players, so there wasn't much hostility between members of different clubs. The captains of the various teams had created a group chat each. The captains of the other teams were all trying to persuade him in their group chats. It really is very tough to win with girls on the team. No matter how good you are as a jungler, it won't do to have a support class holding you back, Zach. Everyone had, by default, assumed that Cheryl was playing as a support class. Dot dot dot. Hey, quit it, guys. I heard through the grapevine that the girl is related to their boss. I reckon she's probably the daughter of a wealthy family somewhere who's just out to have some fun. We won't hold back during the competition, though, yeah, let the rich little princess know about the sinister nature of the world. Even Zack won't be able to carry her, but still bring the team victory. Esports gaming was a team effort. No matter how strong one's individual ability was, if the team had a weak link, it would still be tough for them to win. However, this was also where the charm of esports was. Zach looked at the group chat messages that were either showing concern or issuing challenges and then looked up at the girl currently seated in front of the computer tapping away on her pink keyboard seriously. He smiled and wrote, I'm not carrying the kid. As soon as he sent the reply, everyone got ready to comfort him. However, before they could, they saw his next message, the kid is the one carrying the team, see you guys at the competition. Everyone. Three days later, the competition officially started, and Club HS ushered to their very first battle. Chapter 1033. Chapter 1033, God C. For the first game of the new season, the organizers hosted an opening event where they invited stars to perform. Many clubs sent representatives for the event. Coaches would usually just attend such events with a random member of the team as the purpose of showing up was simply to show their appreciation to the organizers. However, as Club HS was up in the first round after drawing lots to determine the order, as well as because Zach was simply so popular in the circle, all the members accompanying their coaches turned out to be the captains of their teams. All the competitors were resting backstage. The captains gathered and started a discussion. Club HS is so unlucky to be up against Club JQ again right in the first round. I heard Club JQ found a new member to play as support right after Jimmy quit, and the support plays so much better than her. They are also ranked pretty high in the local server. Yeah, my team played against them in a training match yesterday. How did it go? Club JQ has become even stronger. The entire group fell silent, all somewhat worried for Club HS. Be it Zach, Lionel, or even their retired ex-gunner, all the Club HS members were on good terms with the others. However, Club JQ members were somewhat seen as black sheep among the players. They often head-hunted people from other teams, and even players from other countries, by offering high remuneration. They stopped at nothing to win. When Club HS recruited a female team member, they had also immediately recruited Jimmy, all because they were determined not to be outdone. They wanted the top spot in everything and were willing to leech off anybody's popularity. 
To be honest, everyone disliked them. Unfortunately, during the last season, the wrist injury that Club HS, ex-gunner previously suffered had returned to plague him, leading to him making a mistake in the finals. He had then been killed by Club JQ's jungler immediately, resulting in Club HS losing the final round of the team battle and Club JQ emerging as the champion. There was no room for mistakes in team battles. Everyone was unhappy with Club JQ, and no one ever considered them worthy of their title as champion. What is Club HS going to do? With their new support being a rookie, they're going to lose for sure. Besides, Chonk, who plays as support, didn't play very well when he played as a gunner previously either. That was why he switched to a support class instead. When you spend enough time as a support, you'll end up habitually protecting your teammates. Do you think people like that would play recklessly? While they were deep in the discussion, Zack pushed open the door. They were all friends with one another, after all. Since he was aware that the captains were all here, there was no doubt that Zack would drop by to say hi. As soon as he entered the room, the other captains all cast him a pitying glance, which baffled Zack a little. He raised his eyebrows and asked, what's wrong? Someone immediately asked, why didn't your team recruit a gunner when they were looking for new members? Yeah, if you had recruited a gunner instead, a certain somebody wouldn't have been able to join, even if she had all the connections in the world. Even your boss understands that an important position like that is no laughing matter. Sigh. Speaking of gunners, someone comes to mind right away. I also thought of someone. Me too. Me. Drop the, me too. I know who you're all talking about. We've been dominated by her for so many years. Aren't you guys sick of it yet? You can just say her name, God see. Ha ha ha. The mention of her name makes me panic. Me too. When Cheryl was a child, she often encountered professional players when she reached the highest tier in the rankings. On occasions when her teammates weren't strong enough, she liked to play against them one oh known. A good number of professional players had loved dueling one on one with her back then. Even their coaches had ordered them to play one on one with her. Because, one on one duels with her were no different from grueling training sessions for movement practice. Even though she was a gunner, she could still avoid all the assassins and dish out a counter kill. With the way she moved and her reflexes, even the head coaches found it a shame that she didn't play as an assassin. But when they thought about it again, it was true that the gunner made up the core of a team. She would indeed be the strongest if she played as a gunner. Everyone present was a professional player who had made a name for themselves during the last five to six years, and all of them had experienced the era of God Sea's domination in the game. There had even been a rumor among professional players back then. Players who wanted to be on the starter team must play one-on-one -on -one against God Sea at least 50 times. This was the only way to train one's mental resilience. Before anyone realized it, Godsey had already become an insurmountable obstacle in their hearts. At the mention of Godsey, everyone became pumped up, and they started chatting about how she had trounced them so badly back then. Toward the end, someone said, that's why we all thought that your whale of a boss would definitely invite Godsey to join Club HS after your ex-gunner retired. After all, Chester had built up Club HS, reputation as a filthy rich team with real money. Zack, he kept quiet and said nothing. Well, the kid would have to introduce herself when she went on stage later anyway. When that happened, she would most definitely astound these guys. Hey, were they looking down on the kid? That's impossible. One of the captains said, think about it, God C was already dominating the game 10 years ago, so she must already be past the ideal age for a professional player. Her reflexes must have already declined. The others nodded at once. That's true. The optimal age for a player is between 16 and 24 years old. Zack can probably play until he's 26, but for people like us, things will probably start going downhill from as early as 22. Zack was currently 23 years old, but he was still in his prime. Forget it, the list has already been finalized anyway. Let's not trigger him with talk of God C anymore. That said, you now have a little princess instead of God C in your team, Zack. You guys won't end up trying to protect a support class like her during the competition, will you? 
Wasn't there a saying that goes something like, you can lose the game, but you mustn't let the princess die? Actually, that would work, too. You guys can afford to lose a few matches here and there anyway. By the time you guys lose enough matches, I'm sure your boss would also have understood. He'll definitely find a replacement then. I reckon the little princess will probably go home once she's had her fill with playing too. But this doesn't change the fact that we're here to watch you get thrashed by your opponent in the match today, ha ha ha. Now that all of them were joking around, the things they said also changed. The corners of Zack's lips curled into a smile, and he patted the shoulder of the person closest to him. That may not necessarily happen, though. What? However, Zack decided to leave them on a cliffhanger. He said, open your eyes wide and watch the match carefully. After speaking, he stood up and said, all right, I'm off. It's the kid's first time participating in the competition, so I'm afraid she may be nervous. Everyone. His tone was so indulgent. Those who didn't know any better would have thought he was talking about his girlfriend instead. All of them exchanged looks with one another. After Zack left, they thought about it and asked, has Zack been corrupted by money? It's possible. Ha ha ha. Well, that makes sense. Families related to the hunts must also be very powerful. That girl probably has quite an impressive background. Zack eventually has to inherit his family's property, so it's about time he starts planning for the future. No wonder Zack agreed to let the little princess into the team. Sigh. I feel like the spirit of the game would change once even Zack bows down to money. Everyone fell silent. Gaming competitions were becoming increasingly commercialized. However, these captains hadn't been focused on making money back when they started playing, rather, all they had on their minds was winning the game. Among them, Zack upheld his moral boundaries the most. Should he of all people also decide to compromise, they didn't know if they could persevere in the game for much longer. Just as a gloomy atmosphere took over the room, the performance on stage ended. The competition was finally starting. The host began to introduce the participants. One by one, Club HS members went on stage. Suddenly, someone noticed something amiss. Look, why does that team seem kind off? Teams generally lined up according to their roles in the game. Mages fought in the middle lane, so they would also stand in the middle. So, why was that pretty girl standing in the second place from the left? That position wasn't for support classes. Everyone panicked. Is the new member not a support class? Going by the position, she's definitely a gunner. Good lord, the little princess wants to be a gunner. Well, if you think about it, that makes sense. What's the fun in playing as a support class? Rich players love looking for good players to protect them while they play as gunners anyway. In such cases, those players even have to give them their kills. Just as everyone became gloomier and gloomier, one of the captains suddenly exclaimed, Fuck. Look. At what? Look at her game ID. Cheryl's game ID had appeared above her head, HSC. Chapter 1034. Chapter 1034, what's important is that she had participated. Everyone was shocked and dumbfounded. Someone couldn't help but ask, I is that the same C I'm thinking of? T that's God C. No way. Is God C really a girl? None of them dared to say any more, for fear that they would have to eat their words later on. They had originally only shown up to show Zack support, but in this instant, they suddenly felt like they had made the right decision to come. The competition was streamed live online. None of them saw that the comments had already gone into an uproar. See, why does that name look so strange and familiar? Dude, you need a crash course on God See the Dominator. Why did the little princess of Club HS give herself a name like that? Is she trying to imitate God See? What nonsense. Game ids are unique. Duplicate names are not allowed. Did the little princess buy God See's account? Exactly. Godsee was already playing this game 10 years ago, but the little princess looks just like an elementary school student. There's no way she's already 20 years old. There is information about Cheryl in the club. She is 15 years old this year. Dot dot dot. Amid the discussion, the match started. And then, everyone found themselves dumbfounded once more. The comments went into yet another uproar. Fuck. C's moves totally dazzled me just now. 
Are those movements even humanly possible? She was clearly about to die. How did she manage that counter kill with so little HP? Club JQ should have realized how powerful she is by now. That's why four of them tried to surround her just now. God C, who was terrified at the time, thought to herself, guys, hurry up. Four of the enemies are on their own. I've surrounded them. Ha 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 ha. Dot 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 dot. Off stage, in the area where the captains were, nobody dared to say anything. After all, Cheryl's moves in the game were all too familiar. None of them had any doubts anymore. Still, someone couldn't help but ask. So, Godsee was just an elementary student when she thrashed us in the game back then. Ah, shut up. I'm so embarrassed that I want to bury myself in a hole right now. Here's a piece of good news, guys, someone suddenly said. Everyone looked at him, whereupon he said, Godsee took her college entrance examinations this year so the ones who were thrashed by her during the last three years didn't get thrashed by an elementary school student. Quote dot dot dot. Get lost. I can't imagine how young God C must have been when she struck fear into all of us back then. Gradually, everyone started to accept the truth. One of the captains sighed and said, Zack is already difficult enough to deal with. Now that they also have God C on their side, there's no doubt that Club HS will win the competition this season. Everyone fell speechless for a while. When Club HS, ex-Gunner retired, everyone had been ecstatic and thought that they finally had a chance at victory. But Club JQ had beaten them immediately. Now that the new season had started, everyone was all geared up to vie for the title of champion, but in the end, God C had shown up. Did they even have any chance left? However, someone soon recovered and declared, Mateen will definitely take second place this year. Even if they couldn't win Club HS, it didn't mean that they couldn't win against others. Everyone instantly found back the feeling they had when they first played the game. Besides, what was the big deal about Godsee anyway? She might have given them a beating back then, but it was now time for them to get their revenge on the battlefield. Passion was eternal in esports players. They would never admit defeat. Passion surged in the captains once more. Full of fighting spirit, it was as though they had found the aspirations they had when they first entered the industry back then. Cheryl had absolutely no idea what kind of impact her presence had brought to that group of esports players eroded by commercialism. All she knew was, Club JQ was awfully weak. After a month of training, her coordination with her teammates had become so smooth that the match against Club JQ was completely effortless for them. After winning the third match in a row, Cheryl looked at the others perplexedly. How did you guys lose last season? Everyone they felt humiliated. Why did it feel so good to be humiliated by God C, though? Well, it was mainly because their match had simply gone so smoothly this time, so they had given all the coins to God C and allowed her to groom them further. In the past, they were worried that the gunner would be assassinated, but now they could completely trust God C. With this battle, almost everybody could foresee what was going to happen in the future. Netizens were already starting to take notice of Cheryl. First, she had achieved a score of 1598 in her college entrance examinations. This was undoubtedly the highest score in the country this year. Few could achieve a score like that, even in the New York circle. Then, there was God C of eSports. Originally, only those in the esports circle had paid attention to this incident. However, it gradually blew up and started to attract a great deal of attention. Everyone swarmed to Cheryl's Facebook page and began to leave messages. God see, what's your secret to having good grades and being a powerhouse player? Does this mean that even geniuses should work hard? While they were asking her questions, a number of people also popped up and started to recount Cheryl's journey of accomplishments. Someone made a post on Facebook, which attracted all the netizens' attention. I am Cheryl's classmate. She grew up abroad, so even when she was 10 years old, her studies were a complete mess. Every time the exams came around, she either handed in blank papers or got all the questions wrong. She also never once realized that all her knowledge was wrong. But when she was 10 years old, Godsee suddenly turned around and started to study hard. 
In the first year, she skipped a grade to the fifth, and in the second year, she went to high school. She pretty much did in five years what we would take twelve years to do. As soon as the news came out, all the netizens were astounded. Wasn't this a classic example of a bottom feeder launching a counterattack? It couldn't get any more inspiring. Everyone had already imagined for themselves how hard God C must have worked during those five years. However, at this point, a player in the game stepped forward and posted a record of how much time God C had spent in the game during the last five years. Thanks to this, everyone now knew that God C went online for three hours every day for the past five years. Didn't she need sleep at all? At this point, Cheryl went online. When she saw everyone asking about her schedule, she posted a reply. Cheryl, yes, I have been very hard working all this time. Every single day during the last five years, I only slept 10 hours, exercised for two, played games for three, studied for five hours, and practiced shooting for 10 minutes. The entire internet fell into silence. Hard working. Yeah, right. How many people had to sacrifice sleep and wake up at the crack of dawn, spending all their time studying just so they could enroll in a good university? Yet she had achieved that with just five hours of studying a day for five years. Was she trying to crush everyone's hopes or what? People did notice that she had mentioned, shooting, though. Someone asked, God G, do you like shooting? Are you a professional? 1. Cheryl, yeah, I am. I am on the national team. I also like skiing, running, ice skating. At this point, the national team also made a post on Facebook announcing the list of athletes participating in the Olympic Games this year. They specially had mentioned Cheryl in the shooting section. Everyone, fans of the club HS couldn't help but start to worry. Considering how many things God G has to do, the time she has for training will definitely be greatly reduced, right? Can she really do it? Yeah, next to shooting and studying, gaming doesn't seem that important anymore. What exactly is God C the best at? I'm so worried. Seeing this, Cheryl replied, don't worry, my specialty is gaming. The rest are just my hobbies. When everyone saw her reply, they all reached a tacit understanding. Yup, God C's specialty was gaming. Studying was something she couldn't get out of, while shooting was just a hobby. Also, she was just participating in the Olympics to make up numbers on the team. As a result, Cheryl's fans couldn't help but start defending her to outsiders, it didn't matter whether she won a medal in the Olympics or not. What was important was that she had participated in it. Chapter 1035 Chapter 1035, 6 points. What came next was a fully packed schedule. Club HS had regular matches scheduled for the rest of the month. During the course of the competition, Cheryl built up an even better rapport and coordination with her teammates. Club HS won every single match during this one month. However, when everyone heard that Cheryl was taking a week off to participate in the Olympic Games, they were shocked. Lionel was the first to speak. We can still play as usual during your week of absence by sending in a substitute, so we don't have to worry about that. But God see, will you become rusty if you don't play for a while? Chonk cocked his head sideways and asked, didn't you say that shooting was just a hobby? Your participation in the competition is a formality, right? You'll probably be disqualified in the first round, so you probably only need to take three days off at most. Why are you requesting a week off instead? The competition will be over by the time you're back. Benjamin smacked Chonk lightly. Are you dumb? God C is still teammates with the other athletes, no matter what. Even if she can't make it to the finals, she should still show support to her teammates. This is a major event. Besides, we haven't reached the critical point of the competition yet, it's just the qualifiers right now. So, don't worry and just go for the shooting competition, God C. Quote dot dot dot. Actually, I'm pretty good at shooting, said Cheryl. Ha ha ha. Even so, can you clinch the champion title? Lionel was the first to laugh. Come on, stop the jokes, God C. There are so many shooting experts around. You may be impressive here, but your skills won't be much to marvel at in front of others. Still, this is something you're interested in, so we respect your decision. The head coach also chimed in. 
Yes, we will respect your decision. We will definitely be fine in the qualifiers. From how the matches in the past month had gone, it was obvious that Club HS would be the champion this year. There was no doubt about that. Cheryl, forget it, she wasn't going to say any more. Instead, she nodded and reached out for her pink suitcase. However, before she could put her hand around it, Zack had already taken hold of it for her. He said, I'll see you off. Their competition wasn't held in San Francisco, so they were currently staying in a hotel. In order to stay with her teammates, Cheryl had chosen not to move to another hotel. All of them were staying on the same floor. Justin hadn't expressed any opinion about this. After all, she needed total focus during the competition, so it was not quite the same as the training sessions in the villa. Quote dot dot dot. Sure, replied Cheryl. The pair walked toward the elevator. Before they got in, Lionel called after them, it's alright even if you don't get a medal, God see. We have a champion title waiting for you right here. Don't worry, we will definitely be the champions this year. Quote dot dot dot. Wow, thanks for the encouragement, said Cheryl. No problem. Lionel beamed at her innocently. When the elevator doors closed, Chunk smacked him on the head. What did you say that for? Lionel replied, athletes who do not aim to be champions don't make good esports players. Everyone that does esports aims to win, and I'm sure that includes God C2. That's why I tried to comfort her. Chonk sighed. To be honest, when you consider that she can still make it onto the national team when she spends so little time training. If she used all the time she spends playing games on shooting practice instead, do you think she could win the championship? As soon as he said that, everyone fell silent. Come to think of it, what he said made sense. Everyone was terribly moved. Godsey definitely had the utmost dedication to esports. She was giving up the chance to become a world champion for the gaming competition. In that case, they must get the gold medal for Godsey. Lionel, Chonk, and Benjamin instantly became pumped up. Don't worry, Godsey. We will be fine while you're away. At the door. Zack loaded Cheryl's suitcase into the trunk. Cheryl got in the car and waved to him. When she was about to shut the door, Zack suddenly said, good luck. Hum, Cheryl thought. She was about to speak when she saw Zack smiling at her. He said, you can do it. Cheryl blinked in surprise and then returned the smile with one of her own. In order to avoid creating a stir, the club did not make any announcements about Cheryl's participation in the Olympic Games. However, when a different gunner showed up instead of Cheryl during the next match, her absence caught everyone's attention. The fans panicked. What's going on? Why did they change the gunner? Where's God C? The match feels so dull without God C. What are they trying to do by substituting someone else for God C at this point in time? Do they look down on their opponents that much? Are they trying to say that they can win against their opponents even if they didn't use their trump card? Of course not. Have all of you overlooked a certain upcoming event? Most people into esports were homebodies, and it was to the extent that some weren't even concerned about real-life events and spent all their time in the game. However, there were still some who paid attention to popular topics in current affairs. Some people commented, The Olympics have started. I remember Godsey saying that she's part of the national team, so she will be representing America in the Olympics. Did she go to the Olympics? What? You're right. Come on, let's see if Godsey competed today. She probably did, right? The women's qualifiers are taking place today. I wonder how Godsey fared and whether she made it to the finals. Ha <laughs> ha, tell me the outcome after you guys check it out. I'm just waiting to laugh at Godsey now. There are over 100 athletes in the competition. Do you really think Godsey will make it into the top 8? Well, if she does, then she can continue with the games tomorrow. If not, she can return to us and continue with the competition. Everybody went to check out the results of the Olympic qualifiers. Twenty seconds later, a comment appeared. K, I'm back from checking the results. Regarding this, I have six points to raise. Everyone. Chapter 1036. Chapter 1036. Champion. Amid all the question marks filling the screen, someone finally wrote something different. I can't describe it any other way than this, she's too damn impressive. 
She's amazing. Cheryl Smith took first place in the qualifiers. I suspect that the two of them have the same name. How can anyone not only excel at gaming but also at shooting? Sudden thought here, but, what if Cheryl Smith turns out to be the champion? That's right, Cheryl had taken first place in the qualifiers and successfully made it through to the finals. Once the finals were over, which would be held the next day, she would receive the medal. Cheryl's fans started chatting in the forums. Don't go around bragging online just yet, guys. Stay low-key. Low-key, you hear? Yeah, the girl might have lucked out in the qualifiers, that's all. If we start bragging and she doesn't win tomorrow, it'll be really embarrassing. Cheryl is still young. It's okay even if she doesn't win this time. She can always try again after four years. Yeah, you're right. As for the Club HS members, after they easily won the match, the host couldn't help but ask Lionel during an interview, do you have any comments about Miss Cheryl Smith's participation in the Olympic Games? Lionel, who was completely unaware that Cheryl had already cleared the qualifiers, smiled and replied, well, what matters is that she gained some experience by participating, right? Godsey is cooped up in the club with us all the time. There's only so much energy one can have. Since her talent has gone to gaming, it's a given that she won't do as well in other areas. That's perfectly understandable, no. He cleared his throat and added, besides, Cheryl is still young, so do be patient with her. We'll eventually compete on a global scale after this, so we can clinch a world championship title for everyone too. The host. Utterly bemused, she looked at Lionel and asked, Ah, uh, haven't you looked at Ms. Smith's results in the qualifiers? Lionel, who was even more lost than her, replied, Yeah, the match just ended, so I haven't had a chance to look at my phone yet. I was told to come here for the interview immediately. What's the matter? Did she rank too low? But that's perfectly understandable, isn't it? People shouldn't be so demanding toward kids. The host kept quiet for a while. Then, she tried to give him a hint and asked, seeing that Ms. Smith has ranked first in the qualifiers, how confident do you feel about her taking the champion title tomorrow? Lionel. Lionel felt like he was dreaming even as he walked down from the stage. He pinched himself hard, the pain making him inhale sharply. Only then did he turn to Zack in disbelief. Hey, Zack, just what kind of genius have we recruited? The answer to his question came the next day. Cheryl was the champion. An uproar went through the whole country. Cheryl's fans were incredibly excited. Oh my god. I only became a fan because she's so pretty. What kind of unbelievable person have I become a fan of, though? Nationwide top scorer in the college entrance examinations, a godlike player in games, and a champion in shooting. Dear lord, any one of those titles is enough to brand one successful in life. God see is unbelievable. God see is no human, she's a god. At the same time. A proud Harvard University official also posted on their Facebook page, we await the champion. The moment they made the post, people swarmed to it. The staff of MIT also raised a furor. Over at the student admissions office, the head of the department sorely wished he could turn back time. Why on earth had they allowed students to take care of their official Facebook page? Great, not only was Cheryl the top scorer, but she was also a world champion now. If she had picked their school, their reputation would have been so much greater than Harvard. To save the situation, as well as to prevent the department head from holding him accountable for the farce, one of the teachers in the admissions office smiled and said, Tisk, those things can only help us in terms of our reputation. The student that we recruited this year is the one who will bring us actual benefits. Don't forget, he's from the Standards in New York. MIT had recruited the heir to a conglomerate this time. He hadn't even started his studies at the university, yet he had already sponsored a good number of the university's research projects. In addition, he had also promised strategic partnerships with MIT that would last numerous years. Recruiting him had granted MIT tremendous tangible benefits. When the head of the admissions office heard the teacher, he felt a bit better. After all, it wasn't like Harvard University enjoyed similar benefits. However, his mood had only just improved a little when the expression of a teacher, who was scrolling through Facebook, suddenly changed dramatically. 
She stammered, Yes, sir, someone just revealed Cheryl Smith's background. Chapter 1037. Chapter 1037. Why didn't Cheryl's mom take her studies seriously? When the head of MIT's student admissions office heard her, he couldn't help but turn to her. What's the big deal? It's not like her background can possibly be more amazing than our students. For her to train in shooting since she was a child, she must come from pretty wealthy family background. Not many had the chance to try shooting as a sport. However, the thought had only just formed when the teacher jumped to her feet. Close to tears, she said, it certainly is more amazing, she's a hunt. What? The head of the department exclaimed at once. The almighty netizens had indeed dug up Cheryl's family background. However, this wasn't to the netizens, credit but that of a certain somebody who couldn't resist showing off his daughter. This said person had, accidentally, spilled the beans. Mr. Justin, slave to his daughter, Hunt, who had now transformed into Justin, proud daddy, Hunt, had outright given all the employees of Hunt Corporation bonus pay equivalent to a month's salary. When asked about the reason for the bonus, he merely replied cryptically, I'm in a good mood. Why are you in such a good mood? Someone asked cautiously. He'd initially thought that the cool and aloof CEO wouldn't answer him, but unexpectedly, Justin smiled and asked, Have you heard of Cheryl Smith? Yes. She's our first gold medalist this year. She. The man, who was also watching the Olympic Games, was about to sing Cheryl's praises when Justin said, She's my daughter. The subordinate. He immediately launched into a crazy bout of flattery, which made Justin so giddy with glee that he nodded and said, Exactly. Neither of the two lousy boys at home can compare to my daughter. My little girl is the best. The subordinate. Peter had only joined the company this year, and judging from the CEO's actions, he was intending to have him take over the company next year. He was such an outstanding young man. Not only did he achieve a perfect score on the college entrance examinations at the tender age of 10 and complete his university education in two years, but he also completed his double master's degree in three years. On top of that, he even successfully applied for a doctorate. In addition, it was said that the AI system designed by Peter was equipped with the ability to think autonomously. This would undoubtedly revolutionize the world of IT engineering. Was there anyone who wouldn't be impressed by someone like that? Though Cheryl had clinched a gold medal and brought glory to the country, Peter's achievements had allowed the country's technological advancements to progress beyond what was thought possible. But if the CEO said so, then. With that, every Hunt Corporation employee now knew that Cheryl was Justin's daughter. Had it just been the core employees in the know, the secret wouldn't have spread. However, it was obvious that Justin wanted people to know, so everybody automatically began to spread the news about Cheryl to outsiders. Just to celebrate their little princess's victory, the Hunt Corporation's official Facebook page even held a giveaway that rewarded 1,000 lucky winners with $1,500 each. Given the fanfare they were making, wasn't it obvious that Cheryl's family background would be exposed? An uproar went through the internet. There was a Facebook post introducing all the members of Cheryl's family. Here's an introduction to Cheryl Smith's family. I'm sure everybody already knows this, but Cheryl herself is a Harvard student. Cheryl's father is the CEO of Hunt Corporation and the holder of three master's degrees. Her elder brother, Peter Hunt, is the valedictorian who achieved a perfect score on the college entrance examinations at the age of 10, five years ago. After graduating from university in just two years, he went on to further his education. It is said that the young man, who is a genius in the IT field, will soon take over Hunt Corporation. Alexander Yale, also her elder brother, was admitted to Harvard University at the age of 13 and has graduated with a degree in medicine. He is also the youngest surgeon ever and his hands are said to be insured for millions of dollars. Her paternal grandfather, her paternal grandmother, her maternal grandfather, her maternal grandmother. Although Justin's father was somewhat of a jerk, it was undeniable that he had graduated from an Ivy League university back then. Iris, Ian, and Yvette didn't need further elaboration, either, their academic qualifications were no secret. It wasn't difficult to look them up. This information was all on Wikipedia, and someone had collated and publicly posted it. 
When netizens saw the post, they became incredibly excited. As expected, intelligence ran in the family for star students. What a family of geniuses. However, among the envious and idolizing comments, a joking comment appeared. Why didn't Cheryl Smith's mom attend school properly? Compared to the group of big bosses with excellent academic qualifications, there was indeed nothing about Cheryl's mother. Nobody could even find out which school she had attended. After all, Nora had never officially attended school her whole life. Therefore, she didn't leave any academic records. The person who posted the comment was actually just joking, and it should have blown over after eliciting some laughter. Alas, people found the joke especially amusing, so the comment instantly garnered more likes than the actual Facebook post itself, continuing all the way until it reached over a million likes. The hashtag hashtag why didn't Cheryl's mom go to school started to trend. When Nora suddenly saw the news after she woke up, she was utterly bewildered. Chapter 1038 Chapter 1038 A birthday party filled with big bosses. Nora wasn't going to hold it against the netizens, though. After all, they were just joking. She was a lot more easygoing these days. Though the sight of the news had angered Justin so much that he wanted to have the trending topic removed and delete the entire discussion online, Nora stopped him. She said, the topic is trending at its peak right now. If you delete it, everybody will find it strange. It's not like they are really ridiculing me anyway, so don't take it to heart. Justin narrowed his eyes, but then suddenly smiled and said, fine. Your birthday will be here soon, though. A lot of people are planning to visit to celebrate it. Let's not turn them down. Nora, honestly speaking, she couldn't be bothered to celebrate her birthday. If she had that much time to spare, she'd rather catch up on sleep. But since Justin had put it that way, if she continued to turn him down, it would make her seem a little unappreciative. So, she nodded and replied, okay. There were still a few days to Nora's birthday, so after Cheryl clinched the champion title, she hurriedly returned to the club for more training. On the day of her return, Lionel and the others decorated the clubhouse in celebration of her victory. Although they now knew that she was a hunt, they had indeed gotten along very well during the past month, so they didn't shun Cheryl. Lionel, in particular, even wagged his brows and said, Hey, God see. Why did you hide your true capabilities? You should have just told us that you're a master marksman. A surprised Cheryl replied, But I'm really not that good at shooting. Dad, Mom, and my brothers all outshine me at it. Lionel, he swallowed hard. But didn't you say that shooting was your hobby? Aha, uh -huh. shooting is my hobby, just not my favorite one. I also like skiing, jogging, long jump, and swimming. Among those hobbies, I'm the weakest at shooting. That's why I can't really be bothered to spend much time training in it. The Olympics had age requirements for all the disciplines, but the one for shooting was the lowest, so Cheryl had participated in that. However, as every participant was only allowed to take part in three disciplines one at the most, Cheryl would only be able to sign up for a maximum of three disciplines in the next iteration of the Olympics four years later. She was still considering what she should sign up for. Everyone, all of them were flabbergasted. What are you the best at, then? Cheryl raised the keyboard she was holding and replied, gaming, of course. Didn't I already say so? Lionel's lip corners spasmed a little. Suddenly, he said, what a shame. What's wrong? Puzzled, Cheryl cocked her head to the side. Lionel gave her a wry smile and replied, considering how smart you are, it's a real shame that you're not spending your time on scientific research beneficial to humanity, instead. Games could indeed make one a champion. So could the Olympics. However, neither had as great an impact on humanity as scientific research. Lionel wasn't looking down on gaming or the Olympics. He merely thought that if Cheryl had the ability to invent something that could benefit humanity, then wouldn't that be a better use of her superior intelligence? However, Cheryl said, Nah, it's not a shame. Before Lionel could reply, Cheryl explained, I'm already doing that. Had Cheryl only been studying all this time? Nope. After she completed her studies, she also delved into scientific research. For one, she was interested in human genetics. 
For another, the gene serum hadn't been thoroughly destroyed and still existed in the world. Cheryl wanted to study and invent a real, proper gene serum that could bring out a human being's potential yet not harm their genes or reduce their lifespan. A serum like that would be a lifesaver for a lot of patients. It could even improve the constitution of someone with poor health or the genes of people with hereditary diseases. Justin had even gotten in touch with Harvard University and sponsored a huge sum of money to set up a research project exclusive to his daughter. However, all that would only be set into motion after Cheryl won the gaming competition. As they said, slow and steady wins the race. Lionel. Everyone else. Even Zach, someone seen as a golden boy and one of the standouts in San Francisco, suddenly felt a little small next to Cheryl. He was an outstanding man, but compared to Cheryl's mutant-like family members, he was a far ways off. A few days later, it was Nora's birthday. A few reporters sneaked over furtively to the entrance of the Hunt's residence. Sigh, I'm surprised that news of Mrs. Hunt's birthday was leaked. I can't tell if the Hunts were just too careless or what. Who cares? Any photographs we take would trend anyway. Even now, the topic about why Mrs. Hunt didn't study properly is still going viral. Yeah, what kind of sheer dumb luck was it that allowed Mrs. Hunt to marry Mr. Hunt and even give birth to such amazing kids? This must be because Mr. Hunt has superior genes. Although, I've heard that mothers contribute a lot to how intelligent a child is. Ha <laughs> ha. The Hunts have totally proven how untrue this statement is. Mrs. Hunt was a smith. The smiths are also very clever and shockingly capable, so in terms of genetics, she must also be very intelligent. It's just a shame because I heard she grew up in the boonies. Her talents must have gone to waste. Yeah, I also heard that she grew up in a small town in California and has never attended school. For someone like her to marry Mr. Hunt, this must be a political marriage between the Hunts and the Smiths. Mrs. Hunt is so lucky. You can pretty much say that she's a winner in life without even needing to do anything. Shish, a guest is here. Let's see who they are. Chapter 1039. Chapter 1039. A birthday party filled with big bosses too. A. Isn't that Lisa Black, the famous neurosurgeon? Why is she here? After her stint as Auntie's postgraduate student, Lisa joined the medical field immediately after graduation. She was now a well-known doctor specializing in neurology in the country. With her and Lily around, Nora had more or less stopped performing operations. She only had one operation scheduled per month. To keep her life quiet and peaceful, she gradually removed her identity as Auntie from the public eye and slowly became low profile. Apart from the cohorts of students from Lisa's schooling days, there was nobody who knew about Norris' identity as Auntie now. However, what made Lisa well-known was that to date, she was Auntie's one and only postgraduate student. She could be said to be Auntie's direct successor. The reporters were astonished to see her. Lisa was very well respected in the medical field and she had innumerable people in line hoping for her to operate on them or treat their illnesses. She had become particularly famous over the last two years and coincidentally had been interviewed recently, so both reporters knew who she was. One of them said, I seem to recall that Dr. Black is married to Lewis Smith, the sixth son of the Smiths. So, it's not surprising that she would turn up, right? That's true. I heard that Dr. Black and Mrs. Hunt both lived in the same town in California back then. They are probably old friends. Hmm, yeah, it's perfectly normal that she would show up. As the two reporters conversed with each other, another car approached. Through the window, they saw that the passenger in the car was the most famous doctor in alternative medicine practice in New York at the moment. He was Dr. Sylvester Zabe's grandson. Eight years ago, after Dr. Zabe passed away from poor health, his grandson took over the helm and began to study alternative medicine, eventually becoming the chairman of the Alternative Medicine Association in New York. He held an esteemed position in the circle. However, he had no relations to either the Smiths or the Hunts, so why was he here? Both reporters were dumbfounded. Due to Dr. Zabe's position in the alternative medicine field, everyone in New York respected the family a lot. Thus, the chairman also held a highly esteemed position in the field. It was said that he had learned all his skills from the only disciple that Dr. Zabe had ever taken. 
Dr. Zabe's disciple was said to be younger than him, but nobody knew who they were and they rarely made an appearance. Quote dot dot dot. The Hunts are the number one family, after all. It's understandable that the chairman would show up to support them. Yeah. The two reporters continued to converse between themselves. Then, they saw more people approaching. Some were famous personalities and some were celebrities. To sum it up, all the big bosses from various fields and circles had turned up, making the reporters' jaws drop. The two exchanged a look. One of them said, the hunts really are impressive, huh? I heard that big bosses only hang out with fellow big bosses, so it's understandable that those people would be on good terms with the hunts. When you think of it that way, Mrs. Hunt sure has it tough. She definitely wouldn't have anything in common with any of them. Also, even though all those big bosses have turned up because of Mr. Hunt, deep down, they must secretly look down on Mrs. Hunt. Just as the two were speculating, a butler suddenly walked toward them. Shocked, the reporters hastily turned to flee. But the moment they turned, they found that the Hunt's bodyguards were right behind them. The reporters panicked and hurriedly apologized. Sorry, sorry, we'll leave right away. However, the butler smiled and said, Please don't misunderstand, sirs. Mr. Hunt would like to invite the two of you into the house. The reporters, they were dumbfounded. However, the butler didn't look like he was joking, so they followed behind him in trepidation and entered the Hunt Manor. In a show of goodwill, the reporters promised, don't worry, we won't make up any stories in our articles. However, the butler said seriously, oh, you have it wrong. Mr. Hunt would like the two of you to truthfully report what you see here. Chapter 1040 Chapter 1040 A Birthday Party Filled with Big Bosses 3 When the reporters joined the party, their eyes widened even further. Big bosses whom they hadn't seen at the entrance were at the party too. This party must be a top secret one for sure, right? There were so many influential figures here. Any one of them easily made headlines in the news. The Queen of the UK and Princess Lucy were here. So was Carl Moore, the boss of an overseas security service. Even the internationally famous star Kelvin Hart was here. And that wasn't all. The most renowned hacker Solo was also here. Solo, who had been active in the United States the last few years, had assisted the police in solving numerous cases and was currently under employment in the United States. His claim to fame came when he represented the United States in an international network breach and defense competition and clinched the champion title. There were also many other familiar faces commonly seen on TV. One of them was Logan Anderson who had represented the United States in a car racing competition and emerged as champion. The reporters were dumbfounded. Why were there so many people here? Had this been Justin's birthday party, the guest list would make complete sense, but it wasn't. It was Mrs. Hunt's. It didn't matter how much Justin doted on his wife because those big bosses would never go along with his frivolous demands. What was going on? The reporters parked themselves somewhere and squatted down. They knew that if they wanted to know what was going on, all they had to do was wait. Once the guests started to present their gifts, they would eventually talk. When that happened, all would be clear. Nora didn't notice the reporters at all. She yawned and looked at the bunch of familiar faces in front of her. She had already spotted Kelvin long ago, but she merely raised her brows and looked at Justin. The cousins certainly bore a striking resemblance to each other. With a bit of makeup, they would look like they were one and the same. Back then, when she had been overseas, Kelvin had even hit on her. However, after everything ended, Justin had explained everything to her. It was imperative that he did so. Otherwise, it would be awfully awkward if a misunderstanding formed between his cousin and his wife. Kelvin was exceptionally respectful toward Nora now, and he didn't behave as roguishly as Justin had when he was impersonating him. Something worth mentioning was that Kelvin was now in a relationship with Cheryl Anderson. After her boyfriend cheated on her, Cheryl had thrown herself into her research. For the longest time, there was no love interest in her life, until she met Kelvin one day. As an international superstar, Kelvin was simply too dashing. When he confessed to her, Cheryl completely fell for him. The couple had already secretly gotten married. 
After all, Cheryl only wanted to lead a peaceful life as a researcher and co-op herself up in the pharmacy to study new drugs. She didn't want reporters tailing her and keeping tabs on her private life. Both of them were currently focusing on their careers, so they hadn't had any children yet. This greatly troubled Norris' aunt, Melissa Anderson. She urged, you're already 33 years old. If you put this off any longer, you'll face much higher pregnancy risks. Logan, who was next to them, said, yeah, mom's right, Cheryl. I want a niece or a nephew too. Cheryl looked at Kelvin. Kelvin rubbed his nose and suddenly said, we'll try for a kid when Logan finds a girlfriend. There's no hurry. His words diverted Melissa's attention at once. She turned straight to Logan and said, he's right. How come you haven't found a single girlfriend yet? Logan, his brother-in-law was as devious as Justin. The family's banter with one another was a heartwarming sight. Nora smiled. Suddenly, someone leaned toward her. Solo asked, hey, auntie, why isn't Brenny here yet? Though he had found a proper job and was already in his early 30s, Solo surprisingly still looked as young and handsome as he did back then. Nora raised her brows at his question. She asked, it's already been so many years, but you still haven't succeeded in wooing her. A bleak look flashed across Solo's eyes. He scratched his head and replied, well, you know how it is. Both Brenny and I don't believe in marriage, so there's not much point in obsessing over whether I've managed to woo her or not. I just haven't seen her in two months, so I miss her a lot. Nora, the two of them could be said to be star-crossed lovers. Solo had unknowingly been an accomplice in the events that led to the death of Brenda's teammate, and Brenda simply couldn't get over it or let it go. Nora asked curiously, didn't she already let it go after that case from five years ago? Solo and Brenda had worked together that time to catch a criminal. To protect Brenda, Solo had taken a bullet to the chest. A tearful Brenda had called Nora in the middle of the night, who then hurried over in a helicopter to operate on Solo. Only then did he manage to escape death. They had already reconciled in the hospital ward at that time. Brenda had also finally relented and forgiven Solo. The two had even gotten engaged. But for some unknown reason, the couple had separated again later. Solo gave Nora a resigned smile when he heard her question. At this point, they heard some noise coming from the entrance. The pair turned to see Brenda striding into the room. Chapter 1041 Chapter 1041, A Birthday Party Filled with Big Bosses 4 Brenda hadn't changed much. She merely looked more mature now, which made her even more charming and alluring. Dressed in a short red formal dress, her hips twisted from side to side when she walked, forming a sensual and alluring sight. The moment she entered, she attracted everyone's gaze. Her lips curled into a smile. However, when her gaze flitted past Solo, she avoided his eyes slightly. Then, she went up to Nora with a smile and said, Happy 18th birthday, Nora. Nora, she glanced at Solo quietly and then yawned and said, Yeah, thanks. Justin is looking for me. You guys go ahead and chat. Then, she turned and left. Brenda hurriedly followed after her. Hey, Nora, it's been more than two months since we last met. Don't you miss me? Nope, but someone else does, replied Nora. As soon as she said that, an aggrieved Solo followed Brenda at the side. He looked at her innocently and said, Brenny, I miss you so much. Where were you the last two months? Brenda rolled her eyes. You're simply so. We've already broken up. Why are you still saying such mushy things? I didn't agree to it. Even so, we've still broken up. If you pester me any further, you'll become a huge nuisance. After speaking, Brenda's gaze swept across everyone in the room. Then, she sighed and said, I thought there would be at least a few hotties at your birthday party, Nora, but they are all people I know. It's not going to be easy for me to hit on them. Nora hesitated for a moment. Her gaze also swept across the people in the room, eventually stopping when she spotted Morris Ford. She said, I think Captain Ford is still single. Brenda's eyes lit up. Captain Ford is strong and muscular. He's much better than a certain somebody's tiny weak-ass physique. What a pity that I still haven't had a taste of it. After so many years of friendship, Nora now understood Brenda very well. The woman just like mouthing off. 
She said awfully lascivious things, but she didn't have the guts to act on her words at all. She didn't pay any more attention to the two of them but walked off to the side instead. A well-behaved Philip Coleman was currently following after Iris at the back. Both of them had gotten on in years, and Philip had finally become much more at peace. As he followed after Iris, he said, Um, Iris. It's my birthday next month. Can you come for the celebration? Iris was gentle but firm as she answered, It's too far. I'm not going. Quote dot dot dot. But I'm hosting the birthday party right here in New York. Iris. Philip sighed and said, I know I went overboard in the past, and I've really reflected on my mistakes. Besides, I don't have a successor to my Imperial League account yet. How about? I mean, look at how outstanding Cherry, Pete, and Xander are. It doesn't make sense if they don't have accounts in there, right? Iris. The man might have claimed that he had changed, but he could never resist attempting to bribe people with benefits. She was about to reply when a voice reached them. It's fine, they already have accounts, thanks. Given that Justin was king, the boss of the Imperial League, how could the three little guys possibly not have accounts in there? Joel's account had been passed on to the Smiths. Norris, Cat, account would be Cherry's in the future. Xander was already slated to be the next king, so the only one left without an account was Pete. However, they could just add him to the group later. To join the Imperial League, one must obtain recommendations from three members. Alternatively, King could directly add them to the group, too. No matter which method it was, there wouldn't be a problem. Philip. He couldn't help but glance at Nora. He heaved a quiet sigh and asked, Will you come to my birthday party next month? Iris. Philip lowered his head and sighed. I don't have children and I have already aged. I'm already in my fifties this year, and my nephews have started to eye my position. I don't have anyone who truly cares for me by my side anymore. However, Iris cut him off. You have a ton of girls willing to bear you children even at your age, don't you? Philip paused. Iris said seriously, once you age, you'll find that it really is very lonely if you don't have children. I already have grandchildren of my own, so I really am very content with my life now. But what about you? At my age, I can't conceive anymore. You should look for a young woman instead. To be honest, this was also part of the reason she had been rejecting Philip's requests to reconcile all these years. However, Philip's expression darkened. Those women are only interested in my money. Is there any point in a life like that? I'd rather die old and alone than have a wife and kids like that. At the bottom of it all, the man was still the same as before. Iris looked at him. Why do you insist on doing that to yourself? Philip looked back at her. Then what about you? You have been living your entire life for your mother, your son, and now your grandchildren. When are you ever going to live for yourself? We are already approaching our sixties. Iris, ask yourself this, do you really not love me at all? Iris fell silent. Seeing her reaction, Nora knew at once that Iris still had feelings for Philip. It was just that everything that had happened in the past had eroded her passion. She took a couple of steps back, thinking to herself that there was still a possibility of reconciliation between the two. But when she turned her head, she saw two unfamiliar faces staring at her. Puzzled, Nora raised her brows. However, when she saw the cameras in their hands, she suddenly realized that they were reporters. After keeping quiet for half a day, the reporters had reached their limit. In their opinion, Mrs. Hunt was likely the most easygoing person in the room. After all, among all the big bosses in there, she was the most down-to-earth. Thus, they asked, Mrs. Hunt, these people, why are they so polite to you? Nora. Chapter 1042. Chapter 1042. A birthday party filled with big bosses. 5. Nora raised her brows. However, before she could answer, Lisa suddenly walked over. The woman, who was full of smiles, was completely engrossed in her life as a surgeon these days. With her life happy and worry-free, she didn't notice the two reporters at all. She said sincerely, Happy birthday, Nora. Nora didn't pay any more attention to the reporters. When she noticed the reporters, she immediately understood something. 
Obviously, showing off his daughter wasn't enough for Justin, so he was also showing off his wife now. The corners of her lips spasmed a little as she nodded at Lisa. Then, she said, I heard you performed neurosurgery last week. Was the patient. She began to ask questions related to the professional know-how of the operation. Lisa listened to her seriously. Toward the end, enlightenment dawned upon her and she exclaimed, So, that's how it is. Nora, if I had discussed this with you beforehand, those post-surgery problems wouldn't have happened. I shouldn't have skipped discussing this with you when you're my mentor. However, Nora shook her head and said, If you discuss every operation with me beforehand, how are you going to learn and gain experience? Besides, your operations are already perfect as they are now. There was no lack of patience in the country, so this was a good opportunity for Lisa to practice her skills and improve. Although this wasn't very fair to the patients in her care before she fully matured as a surgeon, that was how reality worked. If Nora interfered with everything Lisa did, the young woman would never be able to stand on her own. Besides, should she really meet with a crisis of life and death, Nora would help for sure anyway. Lisa was already the top neurosurgeon in the country. She would eventually become a doctor whose skills were on par with aunties. After the discussion, Solo returned and started to pester Nora. Lisa wisely stepped back. The reporters took the opportunity to step forward at this point. They looked at Lisa and asked, Drive. Black, why did you refer to Mrs. Hunt as your mentor? Isn't your mentor Dr. Auntie? Lisa. Upon hearing the question, she looked at the reporters. Only then did she notice the gadgets they were holding. When she thought of the joke going around the internet recently, she smiled and replied, didn't you just answer the question yourself? The reporters. As they watched Lisa leave, the pair exchanged a look with each other, both their brains malfunctioning for a split second. Suddenly, a realization hit one of them. As Mrs. Hunt Dr. Auntie. The other reporter replied, I remember now. Auntie had come to the States back then. Let me check the news from 10 years ago. With that, the reporter started to look up news from 10 years ago. Cameras were already highly advanced then. So, when he saw news reports from that period. As expected, Mrs. Hunt was indeed Dr. Auntie. The pair looked somewhere a distance away where Quentin Smith and Lily were standing together. Though Quentin had suffered devastating injuries back then, he had regained the ability to stand now. As Norris' assistant, Lily was an excellent surgeon. She was good-looking and knew exactly how to handle Quentin. When Quentin and Lily noticed the reporters looking at them, they leaned closer to each other and posed with victory signs at them, seemingly hoping that the reporters would snap a picture for them. After posing for a while, Quentin refused to do it anymore. He said, all right, all right, that's enough. You look so silly doing this. Lily retorted, no matter how silly I look, I'm not going to look sillier than you. Who's the one who claimed that he was going to protect his cousin but ended up being protected by her in the end? Being reminded of how he had been a teen who harbored delusions of grandeur in the past, Quentin turned as red as a tomato. Ah, don't say any more. However, Lily stepped forward and pinched his cheek. How rare, you're actually blushing. You don't even blush when we do it at night anymore. It's a good thing that boss saved you and helped you regain mobility. Otherwise, how boring would it be if I'm always the one on top? Dot dot dot. Lily really hasn't changed at all, Quentin thought to himself. He coughed and said, all right, it's your boss's birthday today, so quit the dirty jokes already. Go and give her your well wishes. Quote dot dot dot. Fine. The reporters standing in the distance were flabbergasted. However, they quickly understood what was going on. I see, so that's how it is. Mrs. Hunt is Dr. Auntie, that's why she is so popular. Think about it, people can fall sick anytime. That's why it's imperative that people maintain cordial relationships with her. It was just that. Although these people were also friendly and polite to Lisa, why did they seem to be more respectful toward Mrs. Hunt? Just as they were utterly perplexed, they heard the conversation between Solo, the world-famous hacker, and Nora. I'm thinking of hacking into Brenny's computer to search for clues and see what exactly she's thinking. Can you disable your firewall? No, I can't. Nora rejected his request coldly. A grumpy look appeared on Solo's face at once. 
Nora looked at him. You two should talk it out face to face if there's a problem. It's exactly because you didn't have any moral boundaries in the past and did whatever was asked of you, as long as you were paid for your services, that Barbarian successfully made use of you to hurt her. Do you want that to happen again? Her censuring words made Solo hang his head, and he heaved a quiet sigh. It was true that he acted with barely any moral boundaries in the past. Short of taking someone else's life, he had pretty much been willing to do just about anything. He couldn't even realize when someone made use of him. Now that he was officially employed, he faced restrictions in everything he did. He had originally been rather unhappy about that, but Nora's words made him realize something. People shouldn't be allowed to do as they please all the time. Sometimes, restrictions are also a form of protection. He nodded. All right. After Nora left, Solo got ready to approach Brenda again. However, when he turned around, he immediately spotted the two reporters standing next to him. They looked at him hopefully and asked, Mr. Solo, you are a computer expert and champion of a hacker competition yourself, so why are you still begging Mrs. Hunt for help? Solo raised his brows. Don't you guys know who she is? Try looking up the news from 10 years ago. Chapter 1043 Chapter 1043, A Birthday Party Filled with Big Bosses 6. News from 10 years ago again. The reporters traveling here and there for news scoops these days were no longer the same ones from 10 years ago. Therefore, it was perfectly understandable that they wouldn't know of incidents that happened a decade ago. When the reporters heard Solo, they again buried their heads into their phones to search for news from a decade ago. And the moment they did, guess what they found? Mrs. Hunt was actually Q. Even though numerous experts had emerged in the world of hackers in the last few years, Q and Y's positions had remained rock solid. The reporters swallowed hard. They turned and looked at Nora in unison, finding the whole thing more and more unbelievable. How did this happen? How could this be? As they looked at each other, they noticed Logan approaching Nora. He said, a race is coming up in a few days. They would like to invite you to join the panel of judges. Are you interested? Nah. Nora yawned and added, I'd rather sleep. Logan pressed his lips together. Although he was unhappy, he nevertheless uttered an, oh. The reporters feigned nonchalance and slowly crept closer, where they heard Logan grumble, a lot of people want to meet you, Yancey, and many of them are your fans. But I guess they just aren't lucky enough to get the chance, unlike me who lucked out because we're cousins. The reporters. Were their ears playing tricks on them? Never mind that Mrs. Hunt was not only Auntie but also Q. Was she Yancey too? Didn't she have too many hidden identities? Could she get any more amazing? And it didn't end there. The reporters even saw the most influential bigwig of the alternative medicine circle coming over and addressing her as his mentor. Didn't that mean that she was that mysterious disciple of Dr. Zabe's? When they observed Carl and the others, they noticed that they also treated her exceptionally respectfully. The reporters were dumbfounded. The social status of Carl and the other guests, such as the Queen and so on, meant that information on them was already beyond the limits of what the reporters could access. Therefore, no matter how respectful they were to Mrs. Hunt, the reporters would never ever understand why. Things had gone completely beyond their wildest imagination. There was no way Mrs. Hunt could possibly be a spy or a special agent, right? The pair, who were utterly dumbfounded, shook in their boots as they hid in a corner. They felt like any of the big bosses in front of them could easily crush them with a mere finger. Just as they were feeling lost and frightened, Justin suddenly appeared in front of them. The reporter swallowed. With his hands in his pockets, Justin glanced at them and asked leisurely, Didn't you want to interview me? One of the reporters was silly enough to ask, M. Mr. Hunt, when did we request to interview you? After all, Justin was someone high up in the air and usually remained low-key. The only times he ever behaved flamboyantly were when he showed off his daughter. Therefore, he rarely ever accepted interview requests from reporters. However, the other reporter suddenly realized something and quickly said, Yes, yes. We wanted to interview you. Yeah, then let's get on with it. Justin adjusted his tie and cleared his throat lightly. The reporters. They couldn't help but be lost for words, it wasn't like they had prepared a script. 
The more quick-witted reporter of the two asked sheepishly, Ah, Mr. Hunt, what was the topic of our interview again? Justin glanced at him and replied, It's my wife's birthday today. Didn't you want to know about my relationship with her? Ah, yes, yes, that's right. What are your comments on that, Mr. Hunt? Justin's gaze shifted to the center of the venue where his wife was surrounded by the big bosses of various industries. As he watched her shuffle among the guests lazily like a big boss, the corners of his lips curled into a smile and he said, I'm lucky to have her as my wife, because otherwise, she would have been out of my league. Dot dot dot. Amid the reporter's astonishment, the birthday party finally came to an end. When the dumbfounded pair exited the party, a group of reporters outside immediately came forward and surrounded them. It was Mrs. Hunt's birthday party that day, so it went without saying that all of them would be there. When they saw the pair, looks of envy appeared on all of their faces. Someone asked, did you manage to take any pictures? Yeah, those big bosses only came because of Mr. Hunt, right? Someone even made a reference to the joke trending online and asked, did you guys manage to find out anything? So, why didn't Mrs. Hunt study properly? Chapter 1044 Chapter 1044 Feelings that she shouldn't have The reporters The corners of their lips spasmed. At the sight of their reaction, the other reporters immediately asked, come on, what on earth happened inside? I heard that Mrs. Hunt didn't even graduate from elementary school. Did you guys manage to interview her? Quote dot dot dot. No, we didn't. The two reporters answered. Disdain filled the other reporters at once. Meh, Mrs. Hunt is probably the most easygoing one in the party today because the rest are all big bosses. Yet you didn't even manage to interview her. Did you even manage to interview anyone? Quote dot dot dot. We interviewed Mr. Hunt. The two reporters answered. After a moment of silence, a huge buzz went through the other reporters. What? Mr. Hunt agreed to the interview. How can that be? Don't you know that Mr. Hunt is the hardest person to get an interview with? Besides, most of the guests today only came because of Mr. Hunt, which goes to show just how impressive of a man he is. Why would he accept an interview request from you too? Someone even directly offered the two reporters cigarettes and asked ingratiatingly, Bro, did Mr. Hunt say anything? Can you tell us some of it? Come on, it won't hurt to share a little, right? The reporters. One of them scratched his head and said, Ah, uh, actually, we are allowed to share the content of the interview. Justin had tasked them with it. He wanted them all to clarify the rumors for his wife, even if he was just blatantly showing off his wife throughout the whole interview, despite using the word clarify. As for the two reporters, they had been utterly stunned after learning about Norris' true identities. They coughed and then said, let's find somewhere and have an in-depth talk about this. Though the party didn't last long, the guests had specially made their way over from various corners of the earth, so they didn't leave that early. Fortunately, the hunts, manor was more than spacious enough to house them. The men gathered and chatted with one another. The women also gathered by themselves. Cheryl and Mia were playing with the latter's younger brother whom Tanya and Joel had later conceived. The five-year-old boy was especially lively and adorable and loved sticking to Cheryl. He stared at her with rapture and said, You're so pretty, Cherry. Can you marry me when I grow up? The reporters. The corners of their lips spasmed. At the sight of their reaction, the other reporters immediately asked, Come on, what on earth happened inside? I heard that Mrs. Hunt didn't even graduate from elementary school. Did you guys manage to interview her? Quote dot dot dot. No, we didn't. The two reporters answered. Disdain filled the other reporters at once. Meh, Mrs. Hunt is probably the most easygoing one in the party today because the rest are all big bosses. Yet you didn't even manage to interview her. Did you even manage to interview anyone? Quote dot dot dot. We interviewed Mr. Hunt. The two reporters answered. After a moment of silence, a huge buzz went through the other reporters. What? Mr. Hunt agreed to the interview. How can that be? Don't you know that Mr. Hunt is the hardest person to get an interview with? Besides, most of the guests today only came because of Mr. Hunt, which goes to show just how impressive of a man he is. Why would he accept an interview request from you too?
Someone even directly offered the two reporters cigarettes and asked ingratiatingly, Bro, did Mr. Hunt say anything? Can you tell us some of it? Come on, it won't hurt to share a little, right? The reporters. One of them scratched his head and said, Uh, actually, we are allowed to share the content of the interview. Justin had tasked them with it. He wanted them all to clarify the rumors for his wife, even if he was just blatantly showing off his wife throughout the whole interview, despite using the word clarify. As for the two reporters, they had been utterly stunned after learning about Norris' true identities. They coughed and then said, let's find somewhere and have an in-depth talk about this. Though the party didn't last long, the guests had specially made their way over from various corners of the earth, so they didn't leave that early. Fortunately, the hunts, manor was more than spacious enough to house them. The men gathered and chatted with one another. The women also gathered by themselves. Cheryl and Mia were playing with the latter's younger brother whom Tanya and Joel had later conceived. The five-year-old boy was especially lively and adorable and loved sticking to Cheryl. He stared at her with rapture and said, You're so pretty, Cherry. Can you marry me when I grow up? Quote dot dot dot. Sure, replied Cheryl. Her reply made the little guy jump up and down in delight. Then, he looked around and asked, Where's Pete? It wasn't a milestone birthday for Nora today, so it wasn't a particularly formal celebration party. As Pete was doing research work overseas, he didn't specially return for the party. Come to think of it, Peter had already been away for a very long while. Cheryl pouted and replied, I don't know. He seems very busy, though. I think his research is in a very crucial phase right now, so he doesn't even contact us now. Cheryl glanced at Mia carefully after she spoke. Though the latter didn't show any particular reaction, Cheryl noticed that there was ultimately still some disappointment in her eyes. Thus, she said, he didn't even come back for my competition a while back. My club is already the champion in the country, though, so we'll be going overseas to compete next month. The competition happens to be in the same city that Pete is currently living in, so I'll visit him then. I'll tell him to call Mia. Mia's cheeks turned red immediately. And no, you don't have to. The girl was soft-spoken, and her face was small with a pointed chin, making her the picture of a classic beauty. She said, um, I suddenly recall that I still have some assignments to complete. I'll get going now. Mia got up. After notifying Tanya and Joel, she left immediately. Cheryl was a little stunned to see her like this. It seemed like Mia's eyes had reddened just now. However, ever since they grew up, the relationship between Pete and Mia had become rather strange. She heaved a quiet sigh. When she suddenly noticed that Joel and Ian had gone to the balcony, she followed after them. However, the moment she went near, she heard Joel say, Dad, I'm thinking of giving half of the Smith Corporation's shares to Nora. Ian was taken aback. Why? Then, he frowned and asked, Did your parents approach you again? Joel kept quiet for a moment before he finally replied. They want Warren to inherit the family business. Fools. Ian cursed furiously. Then, he sighed and said, No matter what, you will always be a smith in my eyes, Joel. However, Joel hesitated for a moment and then said, But I'm ultimately just an adopted child. Ha. Huh. Ian sneered and said, So what even if you're adopted? Does that make you any worse than a child with blood ties to the family? It's not always blood ties that make a family, a family. When they couldn't conceive and secretly adopted you back then, they told everyone that you were their biological son. Yet when they finally managed to conceive their own child, they abandoned you. You don't need parents like them. Joel clenched his jaw. Childhood memories flooded his mind. As the eldest child of the Smiths, the family had had high hopes for him since he was little. But he could never understand why his parents treated his younger brother so well but were always so callous toward him, and even wished for his death at times. It wasn't until he heard the real reason one day that he finally understood, he was adopted. In the fight with Ian over the inheritance of family assets, children were also a bargaining chip. Therefore, his father had never once told outsiders about it. It could be said that there were no more than five people who were aware of the truth. Even his cousins and siblings among the Smiths were not aware of it. 
Back then, when Ian wanted to adopt a child from among his siblings' families, he had selected him. Joel's parents had gotten into a huge row with Ian because of this, and it was also during that incident that Joel learned the truth. On the way back to the Smiths, Mia held her cell phone in the car, unable to make up her mind for the longest time. She missed Pete very much. She knew that she had developed some feelings for Pete that she shouldn't have. He must have sensed it too, right? That was why he had distanced himself from her. They hadn't contacted each other for over a year. She had been studying very hard in hopes of enrolling in Harvard, so that she could visit the school that Pete had studied in and also go abroad after that, but she didn't dare to tell anyone. From Cheryl's perspective, it seemed that Mia and Pete had fallen out, but in truth, that wasn't the case. She heaved a quiet sigh and put down her cell phone in the end. These feelings shouldn't exist. She would just hide them deep down in her heart, and keep them from being discovered by others. Quote dot dot dot. Sure, replied Cheryl. Her reply made the little guy jump up and down in delight. Then, he looked around and asked, where's Pete? It wasn't a milestone birthday for Nora today, so it wasn't a particularly formal celebration party. As Pete was doing research work overseas, he didn't return for the party. Come to think of it, Peter had already been away for a very long while. Cheryl pouted and replied, I don't know. He seems very busy, though. I think his research is in a very crucial phase right now, so he doesn't even contact us now. 1. Cheryl glanced at Mia carefully after she spoke. Though the latter didn't show any particular reaction, Cheryl noticed that there was ultimately still some disappointment in her eyes. Thus, she said, he didn't even come back for my competition a while back. My club is already the champion in the country, though, so we'll be going overseas to compete next month. The competition happens to be in the same city that Pete is currently living in, so I'll visit him then. I'll tell him to call Mia. Mia's cheeks turned red immediately. And no, you don't have to. The girl was soft-spoken, and her face was small with a pointed chin, making her the picture of a classic beauty. She said, um, I suddenly recall that I still have some assignments to complete. I'll get going now. Mia got up. After notifying Tanya and Joel, she left immediately. Cheryl was a little stunned to see her like this. It seemed like Mia's eyes had reddened just now. However, ever since they grew up, the relationship between Pete and Mia had become rather strange. She heaved a quiet sigh. When she suddenly noticed that Joel and Ian had gone to the balcony, she followed after them. However, the moment she went near, she heard Joel say, Dad, I'm thinking of giving half of the Smith Corporation's shares to Nora. Ian was taken aback. Why? Then, he frowned and asked, Did your parents approach you again? 1. Joel kept quiet for a moment before he finally replied. They want Warren to inherit the family business. Fools. Ian cursed furiously. Then, he sighed and said, No matter what, you will always be a smith in my eyes, Joel. However, Joel hesitated for a moment and then said, But I'm ultimately just an adopted child. Ha. Huh. Ian sneered and said, So what even if you're adopted? Does that make you any worse than a child with blood ties to the family? It's not always blood ties that make a family, a family. When they couldn't conceive and secretly adopted you back then, they told everyone that you were their biological son. Yet when they finally managed to conceive their own child, they abandoned you. You don't need parents like them. Joel clenched his jaw. Childhood memories flooded his mind. As the eldest child of the Smiths, the family had had high hopes for him since he was little. But he could never understand why his parents treated his younger brother so well but were always so callous toward him, and even wished for his death at times. It wasn't until he heard the real reason one day that he finally understood, he was adopted. In the fight with Ian over the inheritance of family assets, children were also a bargaining chip. Therefore, his father had never once told outsiders about it. It could be said that there were no more than five people who were aware of the truth. Even his cousins and siblings among the Smiths were not aware of it. Back then, when Ian wanted to adopt a child from among his siblings' families, he had selected him. Joel's parents had gotten into a huge row with Ian because of this, and it was also during that incident that Joel had learned of the truth.
On the way back to the Smiths, Mia held her cell phone in the car, unable to make up her mind for the longest time. She missed Pete very much. She knew that she had developed some feelings for Pete that she shouldn't have. He must have sensed it too, right? That was why he had distanced himself from her. They hadn't contacted each other for over a year. She had been studying very hard in hopes of enrolling in Harvard, so that she could visit the school that Pete had studied in and also go abroad after that, but she didn't dare to tell anyone. 1. From Cheryl's perspective, it seemed that Mia and Pete had fallen out, but in truth, that wasn't the case. She heaved a quiet sigh and put down her cell phone in the end. These feelings shouldn't exist. She would just hide them deep down in her heart, and keep them from being discovered by others. Chapter 1045 Chapter 1045 Abducted Mia tried to suppress her pining for Pete. Soon, she arrived back home. She entered her study unhappily, opened up her practice papers, and began to go through them. Even if they were not meant to be, she still wanted to chase after him and experience what he had experienced. Mia began to study seriously. To others, having a crush might be painful and might get one down. However, to Mia, this was her only motivation in life. After studying for a long while, Mia gradually started to nod off. Soon, she fell asleep at her desk. However, it was at this moment that her cell phone suddenly beeped. On the display, the notification showed that she had received a text message. The sender was Pete. At the hunts, as it gradually got late, people who were supposed to leave left, and people who were supposed to rest went to rest for the night. Nora sat in the living room and looked at Queenie. Her aunt had also stayed single the last few years, but she remembered that she had once told her that she had a crush on someone. Nora, who thought that she had been talking about Ian, said to Queenie, Since you've returned to the States, why not continue staying here, Aunt Queenie? She didn't mind Ian and Queenie becoming a couple if it meant that it would lessen the pain for both of them. However, Queenie raised her brows and replied, Nah. Why? Nora walked up to her. For the first time ever, the lazy woman took the initiative to be a matchmaker. She said, Dad has been alone all these years too. If you want, I can help you woo him. Queenie was taken aback. Why would I woo your dad? Nora asked hesitantly, Aren't you in love with him? Queenie. She stared at Nora in a daze. It was only after a short while that she finally recovered. When did I ever say that I'm in love with him? She exclaimed. Quote dot dot dot. You told me last time that you have had a crush on someone for many, many years. Queenie burst into laughter. Even so, that person is not your dad. Then who is it? Nora asked curiously. Queenie's cheeks suddenly turned red. After a while, she finally sighed and replied, My feelings are considered taboo in this society, so I've never told anyone about it before. Besides, the person I'm in love with is already dead. Nora. As it turned out, she had misunderstood. As Ian had been friendly to Queenie, and Queenie had also treated Ian well and even shown a lot of concern for his health, Nora had ended up misunderstanding. Queenie, who seemed to notice her puzzlement, smiled and explained, Mr. Smith and I are friends because the people we cared about, cared about us. People we cared about, was referring to Yvette. Cared about us, was referring to Ian and Queenie. Nora looked at her with a puzzled look. However, Queenie looked away. In this instant, Nora suddenly understood who Queenie was in love with. She retracted her gaze at once and said with a smile, Aunt Queenie, I, like Mom, also hope that you can live for yourself. Yeah, Queenie nodded. Then, she noticed an unfamiliar-looking man on the balcony nearby. After a pause, she asked, Is that Truman? Yeah. Nora kept nothing from Queenie. After the cosmetic surgery, Truman now looked completely different from how he did back then. He was currently pestering Justin and trying to convince him to agree to a business deal. He said, this is my first time doing business. What's the big deal about working with me this once? Justin was about to reply when. Truman grumbled, you're my younger brother, you know. And one related by blood, no less. Ah, uh, despite ten years going by, Justin had never once told Truman the truth, in case the latter used his position as his uncle to take advantage of him. Nora, who was aware of Justin's devious thoughts, broke into a smile. 
While the few of them were chatting, they suddenly heard a hasty knocking at the door. When the butler opened the door, Tanya and Joel hurriedly entered with Mia, who said, Pete is in trouble. The look in Nora's eyes turned serious at once. What? Mia said, I, I received a text message from Pete earlier this evening. In the message, he asked me how I'm doing and said that he misses the pot roast I made, but this is our secret code. Her eyes were wide in fear and shock, and she was shaking all over. This sentence means that he has been abducted. Chapter 1046. Chapter 1046. Going to Peter. He had been abducted. Nora narrowed her eyes and looked at Justin immediately. Both of them reacted the same way. Others might not know that much, but Nora knew this very well. Pete had been learning martial arts from Quinn for years and was already a skilled martial artist with pretty good moves by now. Otherwise, Justin wouldn't have had the peace of mind to let him go abroad for further studies while hiding his identity. But why had he been abducted? Who had abducted him? Nora immediately turned on her computer and searched for the location where Pete's cell phone signal had been when he sent the text message. When she did, she discovered that the location from where he had sent the text message was the laboratory where he was studying and doing research work. Nora's expression turned solemn. After a moment's hesitation, she finally said, Pete is likely fine. Justin nodded. If someone wanted to capture him, they would need at least a dozen people attacking him at the same time, but this would cause too great a commotion. Since there is no sign of Pete putting up resistance, there are two possible scenarios. What are they? Mia asked anxiously. Justin had already sent his men to the laboratory to investigate, but they hadn't found any signs of struggle there. This was also the case a few hours ago, all they found were people reporting for work and knocking off work as usual. He lowered his gaze and replied, Pete either gave up resistance because there were too many enemies, or he deliberately allowed himself to be captured. Nora was also of the same opinion. However, Mia was still very anxious. Why would he allow himself to be captured on purpose? It's not like he doesn't know better. Even though she was terribly anxious, the adults were not surprised by her reaction. After all, next to Nora and Justin's trio of mutants, every other child seemed a little immature. Besides, Mia had always been timid since she was little. Nora said, think about it carefully. Since he could send you a signal before he was captured, what does this mean? Mia paused for a moment and then answered, it means that Pete didn't completely lose the freedom to move and act. Yes, Nora continued to gently explain things to her. She said, if he wanted to resist the other party, he could have just texted Justin or me and told us directly that he had been captured, as well as who the abductors are, but he didn't. What does this mean? Mia thought carefully for a while and finally realized what she meant. She replied, it means that Pete has temporarily fallen under someone's control, but he can still access electronic devices. His freedom has not been fully restricted, but he is unable to report the situation to outsiders. That's why he decided to use the secret code method. Yes, Nora nodded and said, this means that he is not in a life-threatening situation for the time being. Mia breathed a sigh of relief. Even so, she was still awfully anxious. She said, Aunt Nora, hurry up and save Pete. Nora. Actually, she didn't think that the situation was that serious. Moreover, Justin had also assigned Pete secret bodyguards when he went abroad. However, the bodyguards hadn't reported anything out of the ordinary so far, which meant that Pete was definitely still in the laboratory. She nodded. Okay, tomorrow, all. But before she could finish, Mia said, I've already asked Dad to get a jet ready. Why don't we go over right away? Nora. The corners of Justin's lips also spasmed. He said, we don't have to be in such a hurry. I've already received news from the secret bodyguards. They have confirmed his presence, he really is working overtime in the lab. However, Mia said very seriously, Aunt Nora, Uncle Justin, don't you understand what Pete is like? If he hadn't been captured, he wouldn't have texted me. Also, Pete always comes back for Aunt Nora's birthday every year, yet he suddenly skipped it this year. This is already very odd in itself. So, let's go over there right away. Under Mia's urging, the group set out in the jet overnight and headed to Manchester in the UK, where Pete currently was. 
In the jet, Nora slept the whole way there. However, the jet was awfully uncomfortable. After they got off and she confirmed with Justin once more that Pete was not in any danger, she decided to go to a hotel and catch up on sleep. However, Mia kept urging the two of them. Aunt Nora, let's go to Pete's lab right away. Even just a glance at him would do. Nora, what could she do? Mia was timid and soft-spoken. She usually didn't have much presence at home, yet for some reason, be it Nora, Justin, or even Tanya and Joel, none of them could say no to her. No matter what request Mia made, all of them would agree to it. Thus, the group went straight to the laboratory where Peter was. Chapter 1047 Chapter 1047 Mia cares for me the most in the whole family. The moment they arrived at the laboratory, they happened to run into a group of people who had just woken up and were getting ready to go for breakfast. The group stopped the trio at the entrance and asked, Our company is not a place where any Tom, Dick, or Harry can enter. Who are you? Mia replied, We're here to look for my elder brother. He's in there right now. These are my parents. We're here on vacation. The security guard glanced at Nora and Justin and then sneered, Are you kidding me? Mia, the security guard said, these two look so young. The woman can only be your elder sister at best. How can they possibly be your parents? Mia, in order to minimize potential trouble, she was pretending to be Cheryl. That was why she had claimed that Nora and Justin were her parents. Yet the security guard wasn't taking her word for it. The security guard then pointed at Nora and said, she looks 20 years old at best. How can she possibly have a child as old as you? And this guy? The security guard pointed at Justin and said, he's probably only about 30 years old. Justin was wearing a suit and had a stern look on his face. Even though his facial features looked young, he didn't look like a 20-year-old lad still wet behind the ears. Therefore, while the security guard might be persuaded to believe that Justin was Mia's father, there was no way he was going to believe that Nora was her mother. A grouchy look took over Justin's face. The security guard had outright made him and Nora people from two different generations. They were about the same age, all right. Mia explained, it's true. They just look younger than most other people, that's all. She took out their ID documents and showed them to the security guard. My mom is already 34 years old this year. She gave birth to us when she was 19. The security guard examined the ID closely, flipping it over and over as he stared at it. At last, he believed Mia's words and said, All right, I guess. Security is strict in the lab, so outsiders are not allowed into the premises. I'll call Peter Hunt outside instead. Asking him to come out. Then this would at least mean that Pete was free to move about. Mia heaved a sigh of relief. The security guard then went into the reception room and summoned Peter. About five minutes later, Peter jogged over to the main entrance. The 15-year-old young man was tall and handsome. As he was going through a growth spurt, his height made him look awfully skinny as though he didn't have much strength. He wore a loose t-shirt, and one could even faintly see the protruding shape of his spine. Upon seeing the smile on the boy's good-looking face, Nora was relieved, and she felt that the tiring night was all worth it. Dad. Mom. Mia. You're here. Pete stopped and panted for a while. Then, he returned to his usual calm demeanor and greeted the trio. He looked at the security guard and said, These are my parents and younger sister. They already notified me long ago that they would be here for a vacation. Surely I can go for breakfast with them, right? The security guard stared hard at Pete and then replied, Yeah, go ahead. It must have been a while since you guys met, so I'm sure you miss your family. Have a good chat with them. He emphasized the word, chat. Peter, however, seemed to understand something. He nodded and said, sure. Then, he went up to Nora and pointed at a cafe opposite the road. Let's have breakfast there. The group went to the cafe. After ordering food, they settled down at a table. Justin asked coldly, what on earth are you up to? Not only was Peter able to leave the laboratory for breakfast, but judging from how he looked, it was obvious that he hadn't run into terrible trouble. In that case, he'd best give him a good explanation for sending such a text message to Mia in the middle of the night. 
otherwise, Justin wasn't going to let him off for disturbing Norris Beauty sleep. Peter was still rather scared of his father. After all, he couldn't beat him in a fight yet. He was still too young. But once he could beat him, ahem. Peter dismissed his thoughts and looked at them. I really have run into trouble. If you've run into trouble, couldn't you just come to us directly? Why did you send Mia such a text message late at night and frighten her so badly? Nora frowned in displeasure. Mia had been awfully pale the whole way there and had looked terribly frightened. Peter coughed lightly and gave Mia an apologetic look. Then, he couldn't help but heave a quiet sigh and say somewhat resentfully, if I had sent you to the message instead, would the two of you have come over? In the entire family, Mia cares for my safety the most. If I contact her, you guys will definitely come. Mia's cheeks turned red when she heard the words, cares for my safety the most. She subconsciously looked at Nora and Justin. When she saw that neither of them had detected the hidden meaning of the words, she breathed a silent sigh of relief and then looked at Peter with infatuation in her eyes. As for Nora and Justin, both of them were rather speechless. Come to think of it, it was true that had Peter contacted them directly, they might not have come over once they learned of the situation. Nora felt somewhat guilty. Justin, however, was thick-skinned enough to continue pulling a long face. All right, that's enough. Get to the point. Chapter 1048. Chapter 1048. To help or not to help. Peter turned serious. He had always been similar in personality to Justin. After all, the latter had raised him single-handedly. Peter said seriously, the lab is forcibly keeping its employees here. His words made Nora raise her brows. Forcibly, yes. Peter explained, they refuse to let the employees leave. Now that you guys are here, I reckon they'll also start monitoring you. They will never let me return to the States, after all, I'm one of the talents they specially picked. They gave me a lot of benefits and even promised me real estate. The salary is also high. But was he someone short of money? Peter had never revealed his true identity to outsiders, that was all. Nora said, you didn't make us come all the way here just because of that, did you? Not only was Peter a skilled martial artist himself, but he also had a few other guards by his side. He could easily escape any time, so he didn't need to have them personally make a trip here if it was just about that. A disapproving Justin also remarked, you can't even get away by yourself when the surveillance is this lax. How useless. Peter. The corners of his lips spasmed and he glanced at Mia. Now that he had grown up, he didn't like being embarrassed in front of others. In particular, he was especially unaccustomed to being chastised by his parents in front of Mia. He touched his nose, the boy had also picked up Justin's little habits, and answered, I'm not talking about myself. My colleagues are affected too. He looked up at Nora and said, Mom, I have 23 colleagues from America who are also facing the same situation. All of them are Harvard and MIT graduates. After they left the country to pursue further studies, they didn't return to America even once. Because of this, they were even flamed by netizens on the internet, but not all of them had stayed here of their own volition. It's because they ended up becoming exposed to high-end industries under their lecturer's guidance when they were still university students, resulting in them being forced to stay here and being forbidden from returning to America. They want to go back too. There are many others like them. There were already 23 such cases in Peter's school alone. Moreover, most of them had even gotten married and started a family there, so they wanted to return to their country with their wives, husbands, and children. But there was only so much Peter could do. He had no problem escaping by himself, in fact, he could even take two or three people with him, but he couldn't take all of them with him. All 23 of his colleagues wanted to leave this place with him. It wouldn't be right, no matter who he abandoned or took with him. So, in case of trouble, mom was the person to go to. He was only 15. It was perfectly normal that he wouldn't be able to resolve such a serious problem. Nora. Justin also fell silent. Peter gave Mia a look. Mia immediately said gently to Nora, Aunt Nora, those people are so pitiful. Like Pete, all of them obviously want to go home, but not only are they unable to, their own countrymen misunderstood them and even called them traitors. 
I'm sure their parents miss them a lot too. Quote dot dot dot. Fine, let's help them, Nora said. How many do we help? Peter asked. Nora looked at him. Since we've decided to help, then we must get every one of them out. Then, she cocked her head to the side and suddenly chuckled. Well, would you look at that? We've got company. Since they have already set their sights on us, let's visit your lab and have a look. Okay. After breakfast, the group went to the laboratory entrance. Peter said, my parents and little sister haven't settled their accommodation arrangements yet. Is it possible to let them stay in the laboratory's lounge? The security guard looked at Nora and Justin and then replied, give me a minute. I'll have to ask the higher-ups about that. With a walkie-talkie in his hand, he stepped aside and asked, do I let them in, sir? The person on the other end replied, let them in. Three small and skinny weaklings like them aren't going to be much of a threat, if at all. Don't get so nervous just because they are Americans, only the big brother of the Irvin School of Martial Arts and the big sister of the Quinn School of Martial Arts can pose a threat to us. The rest are no problem. Yes, sir. Thus, the security guards let them in. None of them knew just what kind of monsters they had allowed into the laboratory. Chapter 1049 Chapter 1049, Black Cat. Rather than a laboratory, Peter's workplace was actually more like a research center. As they went deeper into the facility, just on the way to the lounge alone, Nora observed that there were already about a few hundred people guarding the place. From the looks of it, Peter and the others were doing research on something extremely important. There were also a lot of employees, at least a thousand of them, in the research center. Therefore, the research center had its own employee dormitories and canteen. The families of most of the people under surveillance also lived and worked there, so they couldn't leave even if they wanted to. When they reached the lounge, Peter said, rest here. I'll bring you guys around and let you meet those people when lunchtime comes. I'll give them a heads up first, too. Okay. After sleeping the morning away, when lunchtime approached, the trio went to the canteen with Peter. There, Nora met the 23 people in question. The group was both excited and nervous. But some of them looked clearly uneasy. What's wrong? Nora asked. Peter answered, for some of them, their family members aren't here, but would also like to leave with us. Nora broke into a frown. After a moment of contemplation, she exchanged a look with Justin and then said, how about this? Get their family's addresses and give them to me. I'll send people to pick them up. Peter nodded and went to talk to the others. After a while, he came back again. The boy, who still looked as troubled as before, asked, Must we act tonight, Mom? Yeah. For one, by taking action quickly, it was highly likely that they could get away before the people outside even realized what had happened. For another, she wanted to go home earlier to sleep. She couldn't possibly stay here just because of one or two people. Peter said, actually, a few of them haven't made up their minds yet. After all, taking their families and children with them and leaving the country is a big decision. They are not sure whether their wives would agree to it. Nora thought for a moment and finally said, get them to give me their addresses. I'll send people to pick them up at 1 a.m. tonight. She raised her head and looked at Peter intently. If they want to leave, then have their families display the national flag at the entrance of their homes. If it's inconvenient for them to display the flag, or if they don't have one at home, they can draw stars and stripes on a piece of paper and put that up instead. Her words took Peter by surprise. Stars and stripes. He suddenly smiled and said, okay, got it. In this instant, Peter suddenly felt immensely proud of having a mother like Nora. He looked back and relayed Nora's instructions to the others. Then, he collated everyone's addresses and handed them to Nora. As Nora stared at the addresses, she lowered her gaze. In the afternoon, when they returned to the hotel, she immediately dialed Carl's number. We have a new mission. Carl immediately asked, what is it? Picking people up. Without any hesitation whatsoever, Carl answered, no problem. After hanging up the phone, he gave out orders to Black Panther and Abbott. Both men immediately became excited. Do we get to meet Black Cat this time? To chase after his idol, Abbott had joined Carl's team. 
Unfortunately, Black Cat hadn't been in action much these recent years, so he hadn't managed to meet his idol yet. Black Panther said, when Nora impersonated Black Cat back then, she did a pretty good job. Never mind, I'm going to meet the real Black Cat this time. I wonder who's more impressive, Nora or Black Cat. As Carl stared at them, the corners of his lips couldn't help but spasm. Black Cat's identity was sensitive, after all, she had taken so many lives, so it went without saying that her identity must be kept a secret, so he hadn't told these two dummies the truth yet. Upon hearing what they said, Carl cleared his throat and nodded. All right, get going now. Chapter 1050. Chapter 1050. Escape. At 4 a.m., the hour right before daybreak was when people were the sleepiest. In spite of that, Nora opened her eyes punctually. When she sat up, Justin, who was beside her, also sat up. After exchanging a look with each other, Nora went to wash up leisurely. She put her hair up into a ponytail and stretched as she remarked, It's been a while since I last did anything taxing. I should go get some good exercise tonight. Yeah, how do you want to go about it? A doting Justin asked. Nora blinked and replied, It'd be really boring if we just leave quietly by ourselves. We should make them pay for what they've done. After all, they kept Pete captive for so long. We shouldn't let them off the hook that easily, right? Justin smiled. Got it. Justin hadn't passed down his social connections to Pete yet. As for Pete himself, he was only 15 years old, so he hadn't established his own connections yet. He was still in the phase of looking for reliable subordinates of his own. Therefore, it was indeed rather hard for Pete to save his colleagues. But to Nora and Justin, the same task was as easy as ABC. The couple stepped out of the room and went next door to look for Mia. However, when they went over, they realized that she wasn't in the room. Oh, right. Mia said she would be with Pete tonight to help him with the logistical arrangements, said Nora. Yeah, okay. The two then headed down leisurely. The security guard at the lounge entrance had already fallen asleep. The middle-aged lady's head nodded forward again and again as she dozed. Nora and Justin, who had decided to openly leave through the door, then took out their cell phones and held them up to the scanner at the entrance, where the glass doors immediately opened. The two stepped out. The sky was dim and gray as daybreak slowly approached. The two went to Pete's dormitory. As soon as they arrived, they saw that Pete and the others had already assembled on the ground floor. All of them looked tired and weary. It was obvious that they hadn't slept the whole night because they were too nervous. Nora yawned and signaled to Pete. Pete immediately nodded and led the way in front. As he walked, he explained, I've already scouted out the area nearby, there are no security cameras along this route. There's an iron gate in front, though, and the key is with the captain of the security officers. Nora raised her brows. If you had told me earlier, I'd have gone to retrieve it. When Pete heard her, he let out a sneaky chuckle and fished out a key from his pocket. I already swiped the key a long time ago and duplicated it. Well done, thought Nora. As expected of her son, indeed. In this instant, it occurred to Nora that Pete did have the ability to bring his colleagues out of the research center. It was just that he couldn't ensure their successful escape once they left. When Justin saw the look of approval in Nora's eyes, he immediately poured cold water and said, they must have realized what you were up to, right? That's why you panicked and got us here to clean up your mess. Pete. Unfortunately, that was indeed what had happened. When he stole the key and duplicated it the other time, the captain of the security officers had sensed something amiss and had been tracing the culprit recently. The clues would probably lead him to Pete in another couple of days or so. While he could certainly leave by himself, two days were too short a period for him to bring so many people with him. He touched his nose and grumbled, cough, quit it, dad. Seeing the boy embarrassed, Justin was satisfied. Ha, that little brat. Don't even think of showing off in front of Nora. You're still too young. Nora glanced at the people behind them. When she realized that there were fewer than 20 people behind, Pete explained, a few of them changed their minds at the last minute and decided to stay. Yeah, okay. Nora didn't press for details. With Pete familiar with the terrain, the group managed to reach the main entrance without any problems. 
Pete stopped in his tracks. Mom, Dad, I'm sure that there are surveillance cameras at the entrance. If I open the door, they will find out immediately. We only have 30 seconds before they get here. Are the people who are supposed to meet us already outside? Yeah, they are. All right, let's go, then. Pete did a tuck and roll and tried his best to hide his presence as he rushed over and opened the gate. When the gate opened, everyone dashed toward it. Outside. Abbott, who had personally driven a truck over, craned his neck when he spotted them. Where's Black Cat? Chapter 1051. Chapter 1051, Get Them. Peter stood beside the truck and watched as his colleagues got into the truck one by one. In the end, he looked at Mia and said, Get in, Mia. Mia's eyes were bright and shiny. This was the first time that the girl, who had always been well behaved since she was little, was involved in something this exciting. It was an extremely novel experience for her. However, she couldn't help but be worried about Pete's safety. She wanted to say something, yet she didn't dare to, so she merely nodded and grabbed the cargo bed of the truck. Just as she was about to prop herself up, a big and warm arm suddenly held her around the waist and held her up. With that, Mia got into the truck immediately. Mia, her cheeks immediately turned as red as a tomato, and she felt as if her heart was pounding faster than usual. She looked outside. Just as she was about to speak, she noticed that the doors of the main entrance had opened, and security officers were rushing out of the building. They were about to surround them. Some even raised their guns and pointed them at the truck's tires. Once the tires were punctured, they wouldn't be able to leave. It was at this point that she saw Peter, who had been holding on to the cargo bed and planning to get in previously, suddenly jumping back down. He promptly shouted, Go! Though Abbott didn't manage to catch a glimpse of Black Cat, he knew very well that his mission was to pick these people up today. The man immediately started the truck. When someone fired at the truck, Abbott quickly changed its speed and direction to prevent the bullet from striking the tires. Those guys didn't dare to go as far as to take lives, after all, they needed the researchers alive, so they didn't fire at anyone. Just as more and more bullets were fired and it seemed that they wouldn't be able to dodge them anymore, a commotion suddenly broke out in the distance where the security officers were. Abbott immediately slammed his foot down on the gas pedal. The truck went charging out immediately and disappeared after rounding the corner. When the captain of the security officers saw the truck disappear from his sight, he immediately knew that it was too late. Despite that, he didn't panic. Since he had decided to stay put, it went without saying that he had a plan. Those guys might be able to escape the research center, but leaving for good. Not so easy. He looked coldly at the trio who had stayed behind and said derisively, playing hero. Don't overestimate yourselves. Peter Hunt, you must be the one who stole my key, right? Peter nodded. Yup. The captain sneered. I'll make you pay for that today. And give you a taste of what happens when you don't behave. Then, he took a step back and ordered, go, get them. Teach them a good lesson. I want Peter Hunt's legs broken. They certainly couldn't kill the researchers, but once their legs were broken, it would be even harder for them to escape, no. As he gave the order, over 20 security officers rushed over and surrounded the trio. However, Nora was looking at an overland vehicle nearby. They might have missed the truck just now, but look what they had here. Their escape route had just presented itself. I'll hold them here. Which one of you is going to steal the car? I'll protect you, Mom. Dad can go steal the car. Justin. A grumpy look had already come over his countenance. It wasn't easy for him to have a chance to team up with his wife. What was that kid butting in for? He scoffed, nothing but an unnecessary move. Peter stroked his chin. He was simply speechless at the tyrant. Did he really have to be so possessive even at a time like this? Never mind, it wasn't like he had the guts to piss his father off too badly, either. After all, he was still young. Should the tyrant really decide to make things difficult for him, he wouldn't be able to handle it. Peter came around to the idea in no time. He said, Dad, Mom, you guys hold him back. I'll go get the car. Okay. Upon seeing the trio still leisurely discussing plans despite being surrounded, the captain was furious. Fools sure were fearless. 
Did the three of them really think that he and his team were just your average, run-of-the-mill security officers? Normal people would never be able to keep those people in the facility. They were all elites who had been carefully selected. With a sneer, the captain ordered, get them. Chapter 1052. Chapter 1052. Black Cat is over here. Ten minutes later. Security officers lay all over the ground as Nora and Justin stretched their arms and legs. Stretch a little more. You haven't exercised for too long. Take care not to hurt yourself, said Justin. Peter who had driven over and was waiting for them to get into the car. Fine, compared to his father, he certainly still had a long way to go. Nora did as Justin said. He was right. Her life was becoming more and more relaxed and leisurely these days. All she did every day was sleep and go for strolls. She was completely leading the life of a retiree. Given all the activity today, there was indeed a need for her to cool down properly. She stretched her arms and legs seriously. The captain, who was on the floor, stared at them in shock. He stammered, W who are you? He already had a vague idea of their identities by then. At his question, Nora hesitated for a moment and then suddenly said with a straight face, we're Americans. I know that, of course. The captain thought. Annoyed, the captain retorted, do you have any idea who we are? How dare you do this to me? I will tell the queen about this. I don't believe we can't catch you guys if the UK goes all out. Quote dot dot dot. Oh, okay, Nora replied. The captain. After the two were done stretching, they got into the car. Peter sped into the distance at once. Black Panther had personally gone to pick up the researchers' families at the places specified by Nora. Whenever they spotted a house with the American flag hung on the door or window, they would knock out the hidden agents monitoring the occupants, rush into the houses, and then escort the researchers' family members into the transportation vehicle. To be honest, after Black Panther started working for Carl and began his career as an assassin, the man, who had grown up in Switzerland, had become someone who confounded right and wrong. He was someone who lived with his morals in the grey area. But when he saw the star-spangled banners fluttering in the breeze, a feeling of patriotism suddenly arose in him. However, he didn't dwell too long on it. He quickly took his charges to Black Cat and met up with her instead. Though the two teams were working separately, both ultimately raced toward the same destination. When Black Panther arrived at the pier where they were supposed to meet up, he saw Abbott and a group of people there. They were craning their necks anxiously and looking into the distance. Where's Black Cat? Black Panther asked. Abbott shook his head and replied, Black Cat isn't here yet. They are going to find us very soon, though. If Black Cat doesn't get here soon, we won't be able to get away anymore. Black Panther broke into a frown as well. Neither of them knew that a certain security bureau was currently trying their hardest to find them via the traffic cameras on the roads. However, someone hacked into the system at that moment. In the Cybersecurity Central Bureau of the UK, QNY easily stopped the bureau from accessing the system. In fact, they even blocked the satellite signal. As a result, the bureau could only use the most traditional method to search for them. Because of this, even though five minutes had already passed since Abbott and the others reached their destination, the Bureau still hadn't found their way over yet. Screech. While the group was waiting anxiously, a car stopped in front of them. Peter, Nora, and Justin then got out of it. Nora and Justin were both tapping away on their cell phones. With cybersecurity technology getting more and more advanced, even Q and Y couldn't afford to look away from the UK's cybersecurity system for even a second if they wanted to stop them from finding their whereabouts. As soon as they stopped, the other party would be able to restore the system. Should that happen, it would only be a matter of mere seconds before their whereabouts are exposed. The trio got out of the car and approached the group. Black Panther panicked at once. He shouted, where's Black Cat? Do you know that the vehicle we're about to use is absolute top secret in the organization? Only Boss and Black Cat are authorized to use it. Without Black Cat here, we won't be able to leave at all. What have you people done? Did you abandon Black Cat and leave Black Cat there to bring up the rear? An anxious Abbott also asked, yeah. Where's Black Cat? Nora. The corners of her lips spasmed as she said, shut up. 
Then, she closed the hacking program on her cell phone and opened a program that only Carl and she could access. Abbott and Black Panther, Chapter 1053, Chapter 1053, They Can't Be Together. Abbott and Black Panther stared at Nora in shock and astonishment. Both of them were incredulous. Honestly speaking, they had already found Nora very impressive when they realized that she was the big sister of the Quinn School of Martial Arts. Among all the women, no, among everybody they had ever met, including the men, she was the most impressive one ever. In that case, how much more impressive could Black Cat possibly be? Now that they suddenly realized that Nora was, in fact, Black Cat herself, even though the discovery was certainly surprising, it also made perfect sense to them. At the same time, they also felt rather bad for looking down on Nora back then. How could they have been so clueless? While the two men were plagued with guilt, Nora looked intently at her cell phone and wordlessly tapped the, activate, button. To hide their embarrassment, Abbott and Black Panther asked, what's the emergency plan, Black Cat? Yeah, this is the ocean. You'll have to cross the ocean if you want to go. Back to America, how are you guys going to get there? Abbott wasn't an American, so he didn't feel much of a sense of loyalty to the United States. While the two were talking, they suddenly heard a whirring sound. Then, the coast started to shake a little. The next moment, a black, massive object suddenly emerged from the ocean. Shocked, the two quickly looked over warily, whereupon they realized that it was actually a submarine. On top of that, it was a huge one that could seat up to a hundred people. Abbott and Black Panther were astounded. The two men stared at the behemoth in disbelief. When did the organization get an ultimate weapon like this? With this around, they wouldn't have to fear even if they created a huge ruckus in the UK. This was also Nora's first time seeing the submarine. She and Carl had prepared this as their backup plan in the past. At the bottom of it all, the assassin organization was still an illegal business. Moreover, Carl still had an official identity, a spy, in the United States. The two had hit it off immediately and prepared the submarine. In case there ever came a day when they could no longer bear the pressure from foreign authorities, they could use the submarine and escape to anywhere in the world in it. Energy supplies were also replenished regularly. At the very least, there was definitely enough to last till they got to the United States. Nora stepped forward and unlocked the system with a scan of her thumb. The submarine's door opened and everyone went in one by one. After everyone had entered, Nora and Justin finally went in and closed the door. As soon as the door closed, Justin put his cell phone away. The submarine started sinking into the waters and began its journey to the United States. The submarine featured a lot of advanced technology, including even a counter-reconnaissance system. This more or less gave them a veil of invisibility and prevented radars from detecting them. The submarine started moving in the ocean. Everyone inside also quietened down. From the UK, it would take roughly a week for them to reach the United States. Everything outside in the vast ocean was covered in darkness, making the passengers rather scared and panicky. When Black Panther sensed their apprehension and anxiety, he started to chat with them to pass the time. He looked at Peter first. Do you have a girlfriend? This boy was Black Cat's son. When Peter was about to answer, his colleagues next to him said, Oh, Peter's super popular with the girls in the lab. Even though he's still young, there are a lot of women throwing themselves at him. Black Panther immediately remarked jokingly, Ooh, you lucky chap. Peter, however, glanced at Mia subconsciously, true enough, a flustered look appeared in the girl's eyes. Yet when he looked over, she hurriedly lowered her head to hide her emotions. Peter heaved a sigh inwardly. He had been diagnosed with mild autism when he was a child, but as the son of Justin Hunt, he was extremely prideful. Among all the girls he had ever met, only Mia and Cherry were good enough in his eyes. Cherry was his younger sister whom he doted on a lot. As for Mia, initially, he had found the girl weak and frail, so he couldn't bring himself to bully her at all, and he also started to subconsciously protect her. When he found out that she was his younger cousin, it became all the more natural for him to do so. When had those changes in his feelings for her suddenly changed? He couldn't quite recall anymore. 
All he knew was that in his family where everyone was a big boss, Mia was the one who cared for him the most. Yet, in spite of that, the two of them were not allowed to be together. Chapter 1054 Chapter 1054, Welcome Home Joel and Nora were recognized as siblings in the eyes of the law, but in terms of blood relations, they were actually cousins. Although this meant that Peter and Mia were already a generation apart in blood relations, they were ultimately still second cousins. Therefore, they still couldn't be together. He knew that his parents didn't care about such things. If he and Mia made up their minds to be together, even if they didn't hold the actual wedding itself, his parents would still give them their blessings. However, he knew that Mia loved kids, and people in consanguineous marriages easily produced children with deformities. In that case, he'd rather suppress his feelings than end up causing Mia to regret her decision in the future. She was only 15, she still had many more years ahead of her. Peter didn't want to hold her back and cause her to have to pay for her folly in her youth after she grew up. As the group chatted, Nora answered a phone call. The caller was from the UK. There was faint anger in the Queen's voice as she said, Now Black Cat, that's not quite nice of you. How can you snatch away all of our researchers? Nora answered calmly, We didn't, snatch, them away, they came with me of their own accord. The Queen was well aware of this, of course, but no way was she going to admit to it. She scoffed and said in a stuck-up manner, You made me a laughingstock by snatching them away. No, I won't take this lying down. You have to compensate me for my losses. By saying that, she was actually indirectly giving them the green light to leave. Of course, even if she didn't, Nora wouldn't lack ways and means to take the researchers home, either. However, if she did, their journey home would certainly be a lot smoother. What kind of compensation do you want? She asked. How about this? Have Alexander come over and keep Lucy company? The little princess was extremely fond of Cherry and often flew over to the United States to visit since she was little. The queen had always turned a blind eye to her actions because she thought that it would be nice if her daughter had a close friend. She had only brought up Alexander because she knew that Peter would be going home to take over the hunts, businesses. However, this meant that Alexander was free, wasn't he? That was why she wanted him to keep her daughter company. Maybe she would have a chance of luring him to stay in the UK with the title of an earl or something in the future, who knows. The more the queen thought about it, the more she found it a good deal. After all, Alexander was the next king of the Imperial League. It would be fantastic if she could get him to stay in the UK. The queen asked, isn't he studying overseas right now? Have him come over and tutor Lucy a little and see if he can make her a star student. I'm not asking for too much, am I? Not at all. Nora didn't show the least bit of hesitation in selling her son out. However, she did set a condition. But this means that you'll give our organization the green light whenever we save people from the UK in the future, right? The Queen. How many more are you planning to save? Nora said, everyone who wants to go back to their homeland. The Queen was furious. Don't push your luck, Nora. Nora coughed and said, I'm not pushing it that badly, am I? Well, if you're not agreeable to it, then never mind. Even if the queen didn't give the green light, she would still be able to save the researchers anymore. Things would be a bit more troublesome and take up more of her sleep time, that's all. The queen, the lip corners of the queen, who could tell the underlying meaning of her words, couldn't help but spasm a little. A moment later, through gritted teeth, she finally said, fine, I agree to your condition. Have Alexander come over immediately. Then, she asked, how's Justin doing lately? When the queen had first realized that Nora was black cat, she felt troubled and was caught in a dilemma for a while. But after that, she decided to accept reality, after all, she had already come to see black cat as a close friend. She had even poured out a lot of her secret woes to Black Cat previously, so she couldn't bear to suddenly lose her friend. Therefore, from that point onward, she always went through Nora whenever she wanted to contact Justin. The Queen had been in love with Justin and pestered him before, after all, so she decided to maintain a respectable distance from him. Nora was very pleased with this. 
Thus, whenever she asked after Justin during their chat, she didn't mind letting him speak with the queen. She handed the cell phone to Justin. Hello, Justin said. Hello, Justin, how have you been? I'm doing pretty well, still is loving a couple with my wife as always, no arguments whatsoever. Do you need anything else? Or do you want to hear about what we have been up to lately? Quote dot dot dot. Beep, beep, beep. Did he think that the queen didn't have a temper or what? Who would want to listen to him show off how loving a couple he was with his wife? Justin raised his brows and returned the cell phone to Nora. Then, he asked, can you bear to part with Xander, though? No, Nora answered, but it's not certain who's ultimately going to go home with who just yet. Surprised, Justin asked, what do you mean? Well, Lucy's pretty cute. Since her elder sister will be inheriting the throne, there's not much point in her staying in the UK. She might as well come to the States, then. Justin. A few days later, the submarine finally arrived at a coastal area in the United States. When the submarine emerged from the sea and docked, Morris's men, whom Nora had contacted beforehand, were already waiting for them onshore. They would be escorting the researchers back to their hometowns. United with their families, the researchers turned their heads back and gave Nora looks of gratitude. Any words for them, Mom? Peter asked. Nora, after a moment's thought, she straightened her expression and only said one line, Welcome home. Chapter 1055 Chapter 1055, You care for me the most. Nora didn't just stop at saving the researchers, she also told Peter to spread a piece of news. Should people find themselves in similar situations abroad, they could approach Carl's security agency for help to go back home. They would help to pick them up and send them home. Peter did a great job at the task. He was extremely popular among the international students, after all. Now that Peter was back, he didn't plan on leaving the country anymore. Instead, he took over the Hunt Corporation. On the day that he officially became the head of the Hunt Corporation, his family held a handover ceremony at home. As a show of support, the Smiths all came over as well. Ian could now walk by himself and didn't have to rely on a wheelchair anymore. With a walking stick in hand, he patted Peter on the shoulder and said, You're even more capable than Grandpa. Back then, Grandpa only managed to take over the company in his twenties. Next to them, Alexander said jokingly, he's so envious of you, though. A smiling Ian asked, why? Because you have such awesome grandchildren. And three of them at that. Ian, Peter. The lad had not only praised Peter but also himself. What a cocky little narcissist he was. Peter looked at him with a smile. You're heading to the UK tomorrow, right? Yeah, what about it? Are you gonna miss me? Come on, we're brothers. Don't be a sissy and go crying your eyes out now. Alexander said dismissively. Quote dot dot dot. I just wanted to tell you to bring that person home soon, replied Peter. That person? Who? Alexander was perplexed. A mysterious smile graced Peter's lips and he said, Nah, it's nothing important. He mustn't give away his mom's intentions so casually. Seeing his reaction, Alexander rolled his eyes and said, Ah, you're being cryptic again. After saying that, he turned his head to the side, where he saw Mia dozing on the sofa beside them. He couldn't help but nod in her direction at Peter. Then, he walked over. Just as he was about to play a prank on Mia from the back, Peter caught hold of his outstretched arm. What are you doing? asked Alexander. Peter replied, she hasn't been getting enough sleep because she's doing a lot of practice papers every day. Now that she can finally relax a little tonight, you shouldn't disturb her. I just wanted to tease her a little. What are you being so protective for? Alexander said. Protective. Peter coughed and said, don't talk nonsense. Isn't she your younger cousin too? Alexander pursed his lips and said, she is, but she's always been weak and frail since she was little, so she's really boring and no fun at all. Quote dot dot dot. Lucy isn't, said Peter. That little princess had been as strong and healthy as Cherry since she was little. Alexander grinned and said, I know. Wait for it, once I go over, I'm going to bully her. Peter. Alexander raised his brows and said, once I bully her and make her cry, she'll go whining to the queen. 
And once she does, the queen will release me immediately, no. Peter gave him a smile that screamed, good luck, pal. However, Alexander, who didn't get it, turned and left instead. After he left, Peter got ready to leave too. But just as he did, he noticed Mia's lashes quivering, which surprised him a little. Since their return to the country, both of them had been in New York the whole time. However, Mia hadn't approached him even once. Even when the two families met for meals, she would always use the excuse of studying to skip the gatherings. This was their first time meeting since their return. Are you awake? He asked. Mia opened her eyes. Suddenly, she lowered her head and asked, Am I useless, Pete? Peter immediately understood what she was saying. During the operation last time, she hadn't been able to help with anything at all. From the start to the end, all she did was escape obediently. This made Mia feel horribly disheartened. She felt like she was an utter failure who was completely useless, and she felt like she wasn't worthy of liking Pete at all. That was why she didn't even dare to bring herself to meet him recently. On top of that, she was even harboring those feelings for him. Mia was close to driving herself mad. The more she tried to curb her feelings, the more she couldn't help but think of Peter. It was to the extent that her heart would subconsciously start pounding a little faster whenever she heard his name. Yet when she saw him, she couldn't help but be filled with trepidation and panic. Just as her imagination was running wild, Peter slowly squatted down in front of her. He suddenly said, Did you know, Mia? You actually played the key role in the incident the last time. Mia was taken aback. How so? Peter smiled and answered, Only sending you the message would give me the biggest peace of mind, because I know that you will definitely pester mom and dad to save me. In this world, you are the one who cares about everything I do the most. Chapter 1056 Chapter 1056, Brenda's Secret It wasn't so much that his parents didn't care about him. However, more so than that, they trusted in his capabilities, so they no longer spoiled him as much as they had when he was a child. Sometimes, what his parents wanted more was to train him and let him solve the problem on his own. Moreover, his parents were already half-retired. It was Peter's personal desire to help the researchers leave, and he hadn't informed them about the situation beforehand, either. Furthermore, he had even been under the watchful eye of the security officers during the emergency. This had prevented him from filling in his parents about the situation. As a result, he could only use the secret code that he had established with Mia. If he had hinted at the situation to his parents instead, they definitely wouldn't have reacted as anxiously as Mia, after all, the two of them knew what he was capable of all too well. Mia bit her lip as she listened to Peter. Then, she gave him a smile. Seeing that she had thought things through, Peter breathed a sigh of relief. The two of them were only fifteen this year. Neither of them could say for sure how long their budding feelings during their adolescence would last in the face of reality. Therefore, neither of them was going to reveal anything at this point, either. In fact, Peter had even thought that perhaps Mia would find a boyfriend after she grew up. After chatting a little, the two separated. Mia went to Tanya. When she went over, Tanya was rather surprised. Her daughter had been down in the dumps since she returned from overseas a few days ago, but now it seemed that she had thought things through. Amid everyone's well wishes and congratulations, Peter officially took over as the head of the Hunt Corporation. There were quite a lot of guests today, after all, all of them had to show Peter their support. Brenda was also here. As always, the woman was clad in a red dress, making her a charming and alluring sight. People couldn't take their eyes off her at all. Nora and Justin were currently surrounded by the latter's third uncle and his wife, who were also Brenda's parents. Their daughter had been putting off marriage forever, making them terribly anxious. Didn't she know that they were looking forward to grandkids? Hey, Nora, you're her sister-in-law, so I'm sure she'll listen to you if you talk to her. She's already 30, if she continues to put off marriage, she won't be able to find a good man anymore. Brenda's mother dabbed at her eyes. Brenda's father was also very troubled. Wasn't that young hacker guy from some time back pretty nice? Why did they break up? Also, I heard he's still single. Brenda's mother nodded. I also heard that Solo is an orphan. 
he's pretty much all ready to be our son-in-law. Where are you going to find someone better than him? Nora, she also wanted to know why Solo and Brenda had broken up. Even though Solo had been persistently trying to court Brenda, the woman simply wouldn't stop hiding from him. She thought for a moment and then said, All right, I'll talk to her when I have the time. Okay. Brenda's mother didn't pester her any further. Out of all the hunts, she understood the best just how infamous Nora was for her indolence. She was reluctant to take on any kind of responsibilities and would rather spend that time sleeping instead. Also, she never made promises to anyone easily. Now that she had given her word that she would talk to Brenda, this meant that she would definitely try to help. As for Nora herself, she also felt that it was about time she did something. Before this, she hadn't wanted to interfere with Brenda and Solo's relationship because, for one, she felt that they were already adults, it wasn't like they were kids like Cherry and Pete, and everyone had the right to choose how they wanted to spend their lives. For another, the two of them might not want her to interfere, either. But now, with Solo unable to improve the situation, as Brenda's sister-in-law, she had no choice but to do something. She sighed silently. When was trouble ever going to stop? This was no doubt going to keep her from her beauty sleep again. Both the host and the guests enjoyed themselves at the party. Soon, the party ended. As the host, Peter went to see the guests out while Nora and Justin slacked off behind the scenes. Nora kept observing Brenda. Solo was out on a mission today, so he hadn't attended the party. Though Brenda had a smile on, there was some forlornness in her eyes. At this point, her cell phone rang. She looked at it and hurriedly answered the phone call. The caller said something, upon which Brenda immediately replied, Okay, I'm on my way. Then, she hurriedly left. Nora looked at her and then exchanged a look with Justin. Both of them knew that the reason for Brenda's rejection of Solo probably lay right in this phone call. They followed after her immediately. Chapter 1057 Chapter 1057 Brenda has a secret lover. Brenda got into her car immediately after she left. The way she looked like she was in a huge hurry made her seem somewhat anxious, and she didn't notice that Nora and Justin were behind her. Nora followed behind her in a car. After some time, they arrived at a villa on the outskirts of New York. Brenda stopped the car, got out, and started walking toward the villa. However, she had only taken a couple of steps when she stopped and returned to the car. By the time she came out of the car again, she had already changed into another set of clothes. The red gown was now a black dress, turning her from a vibrant and gorgeous woman into a dignified and self-composed one. Her actions confused Nora. Brenda had even beaten red lights just to race all the way here, so why did she change her clothes after she arrived? Also, what was this place? After Brenda entered the villa, Justin finally said, this is her villa. Nora, did this mean that Brenda had really found another man? Was she even keeping her secret lover here? She broke into a frown. To avoid disturbing Brenda, the two waited outside quietly. After a good four to five hours, Nora even managed to take a nap during this time, Brenda finally came out of the villa in a different black dress. Her hair was damp, and it was obvious that she had just taken a bath. Brenda got into her car and left. Just as Nora and Justin were about to get out of their car and approach the villa to have a look around and see who exactly the villa was housing, a skinny figure suddenly rushed over to the villa. It was. Solo. So, apart from them, Solo was tailing Brenda, too. Solo had an awful look on his countenance. He stared hard at the door of the villa, seemingly never having even considered the possibility that Brenda was keeping a lover here. He then thought of how Brenda had come out of the villa looking like she had just taken a bath. On top of that, her cheeks were even rosy. It was obvious that she'd just done some exercise. And she even changed her clothes. No matter how he looked at it, it was the complete picture of someone committing adultery. The corners of Nora's lips spasmed a little, and she finally got out of the car and walked up to Solo. At the sound of footsteps coming from behind, Solo turned around. When he saw Nora, his eyes immediately reddened as though he had just seen someone whom he could depend on. He said, Say, Auntie, just what exactly am I doing wrong? Why is Brenny doing this to me? 
Nora, but before she could even say anything, Solo lost it. He said, I don't believe this is happening. My eyes must be playing tricks on me. The woman who went in isn't Brenny, right? Although she makes dirty jokes all the time, she's actually never been a promiscuous woman. I was her first man, as well as her only one. She would never cast me aside. Solo clenched his fists. Quote dot dot dot. Actually, you don't have to be like this. If you want to know what's going on, why don't you just knock on the door? Solo. He knew that the truth would present itself before him the instant he knocked, of course. The problem was, he didn't dare to. He was afraid that his guess would turn into reality. He could never accept it if that happened, because after Brenda started ignoring him, he had thought of every possible reason under the sun except this one. He trusted Brenda. While he was in a dilemma, Nora went straight up to the door and pressed the doorbell. Solo. Solo was also scared that he wanted to turn and flee, but a moment later, he heard a woman's voice coming from the door. Who is it? Then, the door opened. A middle-aged lady who looked to be in her fifties or sixties stood at the door and looked at them in trepidation. Who are you looking for? Solo heaved a sigh of relief. However, the next instant, he heard the middle-aged lady ask, Are you looking for my son? He's already asleep. Her son. Solo's mind instantly went blank. So, Brenda was not only keeping a pretty boy secret lover but also taking care of his entire family. While he was lost in thought, Nora asked, Oh, I saw Brenda leave this villa just now. May I know how she is related to your son? Solo tensed up at once and looked at the middle-aged lady nervously. The lady smiled and answered, Oh, Brenda. She's my daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-law, and, my son is already asleep. The combination of these words immediately turned Solo as pale as a sheet. Was Brenda already, married to someone else? Chapter 1058. Chapter 1058, he's still alive. Solo felt as if his mind had gone completely blank, and he felt a little unsteady on his feet. He turned away in shock, not quite sure who or where he should be looking, or what he should do at this moment. After a brief silence, Nora asked, what's your son's name? The lady answered, oh, my son. He's a really tall and handsome chap. His name is Marcus, and he's a police officer. Do you guys know each other? Marcus. Though Nora was puzzled, she did find the name somewhat familiar. In contrast, it was Solo who suddenly understood what was going on. He stared at the lady in front of him in disbelief and then suddenly took a step back, his face turning even paler than before. Nora, who detected his unusual reaction, looked at the lady again and asked, Ma'am, has your son been staying here all along? Yeah, the lady smiled and said, Shish, keep it down, my son is asleep. If you're looking for my daughter-in-law, how about I give her a phone call for you? Nora nodded. The lady then closed the door. Nora looked at Solo, who explained, Marcus. He is Brenda's comrade who died protecting her back then, but isn't he dead? Nora's eyes narrowed at Solo's words. No wonder she had found his name so familiar just now. She'd heard about Brenda's past where Solo had, due to a freak combination of factors, accidentally caused Marcus to die while saving Brenda. This was also why it had been impossible between Solo and Brenda back then. Later, Solo had made countless attempts to redeem himself, which ultimately made Brenda relent and change her mind. The pair had been about to get engaged when Brenda suddenly started to reject him again and insisted on breaking off the engagement. So, had all that been because of Marcus's return? Nora looked at the villa again. Suddenly, the voice of the middle-aged lady from earlier reached their ears. Oh, you're awake, son. Yeah, who's outside, mom? The other party's voice belonged to a man. I don't know, just a few passers-by. They are probably your wife's friends. By the way, when are the two of you going to have kids? I can't wait to have grandkids. Well, it's no hurry. Aren't we already trying our best? The rest of the conversation was too soft to be audible, it was likely that they had gone into another room. Solo turned even paler. For a moment, he didn't know whether he should feel guilty or scared. Was it possible for the dead to come back to life? Or, had Marcus been alive all along? 
but Marcus had died in an explosion while trying to save Brenda, and his body had even been laid to rest. How could he possibly still be alive? Nora and Justin exchanged a look. Justin was currently tapping away on his cell phone. After a while, he passed the phone to her. During that short while, Justin had already hacked into the government network and was checking the information in the police system. Marcus's status was verified as deceased. Solo was still lost in thought. Nora looked at him and said, rather than puzzling over it here, let's just ask the person involved and find out what exactly is going on. Since they were unsure about the situation with the man inside the villa, they couldn't possibly force their way in. Their only option now was to contact Brenda. Nora called Brenda, who answered right away. She sounded rather tired. Hi, Nora, what's up? Nora asked, what on earth is going on with Marcus? Brenda fell silent. Nora looked at the villa. We're outside the villa right now. If you don't explain what's going on, I can't promise you that Solo won't force his way in. The moment she said that, Brenda immediately panicked and said, don't. I, I'll come back right away, no, wait, let's meet at the cafe at the entrance of the neighborhood instead. Okay. After hanging up, Nora and Justin took the despondent Solo with them and went to the cafe. As soon as they entered, they saw Brenda racing over in the car. She entered the cafe immediately after she parked. Solo had already gotten up from his seat and was looking at her in shock. What on earth is going on, Brenny? Is Marcus still alive? Chapter 1059 The Truth A hesitant look formed in Brenda's eyes when she saw Solo. A moment later, she lowered her gaze and suddenly said, Come with me, guys. Then, she headed straight toward the villa. The group followed after her. Brenda took out a card key, swiped it at the entrance, and opened the door. When Nora and the others saw how well she knew her way around the house, they couldn't help but exchange a look with one another. From the looks of it, Brenda often came over. It was likely she treated the villa as her home. After Brenda entered, the middle-aged lady from earlier appeared. When she saw Brenda and the people behind her, she smiled and said, You're back, Brenda. They must be your friends. Here, make yourselves at home. I'll get you guys some coffee. Without giving them a chance to refuse, she went into the kitchen and began to boil some water. Brenda pointed to the sofa and gestured for them to have a seat. Then, she entered the kitchen and said, Let me do it, Mom. Solo's heart sank. Brenda had called her, Mom. And she had even been so natural when she did it. He clenched his fists. However, the lady frowned and said, Shoo, shoo. Go and keep the guests company instead. Mom can handle all these just fine. She ushered Brenda out of the kitchen and then said with a smile, I'll go up and wake Marcus. How can he continue sleeping when there are guests in the house? Geez. I'll get him to go get some nice little snacks or something. Brenda's expression turned a little nervous. However, she didn't say anything. The lady then went up the stairs and pushed the door to the master bedroom open. She called out, Hey, Marcus. Go out and get some snacks. We have guests in the house. A man's voice was then heard coming from the second floor. All right. Mom. The lady then came back down and continued making coffee. When Solo heard the voice from the upper floor, his expression turned even more awful. Moreover, it sounded like the voice had come from the master bedroom, Solo got onto his feet to charge upstairs. His fists clenched again and again, but he ultimately forced himself to resist the urge. He didn't want to make things difficult for Brenda. If Brenda really was already married, he didn't want to break up her family. As though all the strength in him had suddenly left him, he sat back down on the sofa. At this point, the lady had finished making the coffee and brought it over. She said, you guys are Brenda's friends, right? You should talk some sense into her, she's already in her thirties. It's about time she considers having kids. Solo lowered his gaze. At this point, the lady suddenly looked at the stairs and got up. Why isn't Marcus here yet? I'll get him. She then went up the stairs again. However, a short while later, she suddenly screamed. Brenda rushed up the stairs anxiously. Nora and Justin followed closely behind her. Solo was the only one who stayed where he was. However, after hesitating for a moment, he still decided to follow them upstairs. 
When Nora arrived on the upper floor, she noticed that the door to the master bedroom was ajar. The lady's voice could be heard coming from within. Marcus, Marcus, what happened? Quick, get the doctor here. Nora rushed into the room immediately. She was a doctor and could save the patient in times of emergency. But when she went in, she saw the lady collapsed on the floor. Brenda was squatting beside her and pulling her arm. Mom, it's okay, it's okay. Marcus is fine. No, he's not. Doctor, doctor. The lady screamed. Nora quickly stepped forward and said calmly, I'm a doctor. What's wrong? As soon as she heard Nora, the lady grabbed her hand and said, Please, save my son. Save my son. Nora's gaze followed the direction where she was pointing and looked at the bed. The lady screamed, Why isn't my son waking up? Why isn't he getting up? Nora's expression instantly changed. There was nobody on the bed at all. Chapter 1060 So that's what had happened. Surprised, she looked at Brenda, who shook her head at her and then continued to comfort the middle-aged lady. She said, Mom, why don't you go outside first? I'll wake him up. Don't worry, everything is okay. What do you mean everything is okay? Something must have happened. I'm not blind. Tell me, what exactly is going on with Marcus? The lady gripped Brenda's hands tightly, her emotions gradually changing. She demanded, tell me, did you guys have an argument? Or is it because you're unwilling to have children with my son? Is that why he became like this? Brenda, how can you reject having children with him? You're too much. After speaking, she immediately started hitting and kicking Brenda. Brenda held her tightly, not at all bothered even when the lady hit her a few times. It was Nora who couldn't stand to watch her actions any longer that knocked the lady out with a karate chop to the neck. Only then did the commotion stop. The huge skirmish had already made Brenda all out of breath, and even her clothes and hair were in a total mess. She sighed and said, I'll go take another bath. Nora nodded. After giving the lady some medicine to calm her down, she left the room. The trio waited for Brenda downstairs. After the incident just now, Solo had understood something. So, she had taken a bath earlier because of this. It wasn't because she was married. He paced back and forth as he said, what on earth is going on, though? Why does she think that Marcus is alive? And who is that man who was talking in the room? While the trio was thinking, Brenda came down the stairs. She toweled her damp hair and collapsed onto the sofa. She was so exhausted that she was close to collapsing. The others didn't urge her to hurry. After Brenda caught her breath, she finally sighed and said, that's an AI system. What? Solo was taken aback. Brenda tossed a pair of spectacles to him and gestured for him to put them on. The moment Solo did, a figure appeared in front of him, giving Solo such a huge shock that he couldn't help but take a step back. In his vision, Marcus moved somewhat stiffly and unnaturally. The figure said, Hi, friend. It was Marcus's voice. Brenda rubbed her temples. Marcus's mom has been denying the fact that Marcus is already dead. I don't know who tricked her, but they inserted a chip into her eyes that allowed her to see and even talk to Marcus. Her mental health is terrible, and we are not allowed to say that Marcus has already passed away, the chip isn't very stable, though, and, Marcus, would sometimes freeze and stop moving. When that happens, she panics and calls me. I was here just now to calm her down and reboot the system. Solo asked, then she was referring to you as her daughter-in-law because. Brenda sighed and answered, in her eyes, Marcus and I are married. That's why she keeps calling me her daughter-in-law, she has also been dying for a grandchild. Brenda lowered her head. However, Solo understood what was going on. He stepped forward and held Brenda's hands. So, this is why you've been rejecting me. Brenda nodded. Solo, however, was close to tears. He said, but I don't mind at all. I can support her and keep her company with you. I can even treat her like she's my mom. Brenda gave him a wry smile and said, and then, what kind of identity are you going to use to stay by her side? Her question stumped Solo. Brenda lowered her head and said, I've never considered marriage at all in the past anyway, so let's just keep things this way. I'm pretty okay with how things stand now. She then pointed at the door and added, you can leave now. Don't ever look for me again. Thanks for watching. 
Like and subscribe for more videos.